Man of the moment, he making the promise to improve on critical sectors of the state economy if given the opportunity to serve for a second term. The D5 governors say they remain committed members of their party, the PDP, calling on Nigerians to support her in future elections. The G5 governors are insisting that the party's national chairman, Yocha Ayu, must step down. But Ayu has refused and this has resulted in a stalemate. Olu of famous call, Arise News, Ibadan. Right, a lot to talk about this morning. Are you? Yes, a lot mm. to talk about. Okay, so let's start off with the first um, the first part of the story, which was Ashiwajibola Ahmed Tinubu taking the APC presidential campaign train to the Edo State capital of Benin City, um, going into Edo State. And the comments made by him, amidst other things, during his address to the team, you know, to the, to the people who turned out for him, um, he said, uh, uh, former President Olusha Gwabasanjo is not qualified to recommend anyone because of his failures. So again, I'd just like to uh, talk about the, because sometimes when these candidates speak, I wonder if they forget that the current administration is under the APC. So President Muhammad Buhari belongs to the party and they are chieftains of the party. It begs to believe as to do parties in, political parties in Nigeria have ideologies. What is the ideology? What do they stand for? Do candidates under their umbrella, do they run as individuals or do they run based on the mandate of the party? Is it based on the on what the party has promised to do for the Nigerian people? Because to be fair, I mean, just to show or demonstrate the importance of a political party is that when you go to the ballots, oftentimes it's just the party logo that you put your thumbprint beside. So as much as we're voting for the individual, we're also also voting for his party in many cases. And so let's look at uh, the former president, Olusha Gwabasanjo's failures, in quotes, as he said, to the current administration's performance in government. Again, my yardstick could be based on economic prosperity, on how he's been able to handle the economy. Because when it's convenient, if I put it that way, Ashwajibola Ahmed Tinubu aligns with this um, government and says he will continue the good work that they've started. And on some occasions, he will stand alone. So in 19, in 2007, when President Olusha Gwabasanjo left office, the exchange rate was $197. Today, it's about $448. 197 naira. Naira, dollar. sorry, to the dollar. While it's 448 naira today to the dollar. Uh, public debt then was uh, 20. 73 billion, whilst today it's over a hundred billion dollars. So do the math. So unemployment rate at the time was 3.4 percent, whilst uh, with this current um, government, we've had the last figures two years ago, and it stands at it's a, it, it's a double digit figure. We have um, it on record that. This government, this administration, has the worst GDP rate since 1999. Um, and also, external reserves, when um, President Olusha Gwabasanjo was living in 2007, he left a kitty of $43.1 billion. Uh, today, we have under $40 billion under President Muhammadu Buhari. 
So it's difficult for us to to listen when um, to uh, when the Ashwaju Bola Metinbu talks about a failure of a government when he's not addressing the failure of his um, own party under President Muhammadu Buhari. And then let me talk about the merit of his statements he said in Edo State. I missed the other things he's talked about, which he's promised during the other campaigns. I want to touch on an aspect that um, I'm, I'm glad that he mentioned, which is bringing tourism, you know, commending the Western nation for returning the Benin artifacts, but also saying that in addition to returning these artifacts, they ought to have paid Nigeria a compensation. Because in the years when the artifacts were with them, they were making money from these artifacts through exhibitions and, you know, in their museums. And so I totally agree with that. I'm glad that he's talked about the potential that Nigeria has with becoming a tourist destination, especially with um, in the area of cultural tourism. This is something that we should be speaking about as we continue to press on to um, non-oil revenue. This is an aspect that has been largely ignored uh, despite the tourism policy, national to tourism policy, a lot hasn't been done. So beyond Benin and Edo State, other states in Nigeria, festivals, we are culturally rich in this nation, and so I hope that the next government will pay close attention to that. I'll move on because of our time, but I mean, on Shea Mackinde, it's very clear. Governor Shea Mackinde's rally in, um, he's launching his rally in Oyo State and the G5 governor's presence there. It is clear that people are aware, people are watching. And despite the fact that they're coming out and saying that the internal wranglings, they've not been able to sort it out, it just might cost him this governorship election. But the next few days and weeks will tell as to how far it would affect his campaign. Dr. Batu? How much time do we have? Okay, let me see what I can do in the remaining uh, few minutes. Let me start with uh, Shei Makide in Ibadan. Yes, he had that solidarity with the uh, G5 governors who were there, uh, but of what value is it to him? Shei Makide is clearly in trouble in Oyo State. Um, Choosing to be a boy boy to uh, the G5 group, a boy boy to uh, Yesum Wiki, may cost him heavily in that election. And why do I say that? I mean, he said he was doing uh, Omitutun 2.0, sustainable development. But the G5 governors, including Shei Makinde himself, they were embarrassed yesterday at that rally. Because when uh, yes, some Wiki took the microphone and was saying that people should vote for other levels and then for the presidential candidate, Shei Makinde will tell you what to do. The people were chanting Atiku, Atiku, Atiku. It was therefore, in that regard, a very embarrassing outfit for them. Which means that the PDP in Oyo State is clearly divided. Yes, uh, Chief Arapaja, uh, former deputy national chairman of the party, or no, current national deputy chairman of the party, was there. The chairman of the party himself, uh, Ogunwero, was also there. But key elements within the People's Democratic Party in Oyo State were not there. Uh, what's her name? Jumaka Akinjide was not there. All the other principal uh, parties in that uh, Oyo state, they were not there. Chief Golarume was not there. But the people, the voters, the electorate themselves in uh, Oyo state were there. So that's a message uh, to Shei Makinde himself, uh, you know, realizing that he's, he's head of a divided party. So does he want to jeopardize his own interest on a boy boy uh, basis? So that's a big question for Shei Makede. However, at that same rally, uh, Samuel Otom, who has been ambiguous about his choice in the matter, was saying that, oh, you know, uh, they are supporting the People's Democratic Party. Okay, where exactly does uh, Governor Samuel Otom, where does he stand? Is it with Peter Obi, Pete Obi, as they call him, uh, you know, or is it with uh, the People's Democratic Party? We were told before now that the G5 governors and the Integrity Group will announce their choice by January 5. They've not done so. January 5 has passed. Okay, maybe what they are planning to do is to leave it till maybe the end of the month, when it will be too late for the People's Democratic Party 
uh, to make any difference. But what is clear is that the G5 governors, the integrity group, you know, they are making a good uh, effort at uh, making the uh, People's Democratic Party appear as a divided party. Whether that works in their interest in the long run remains to be seen after the February 25 uh, election. In the meantime, these uh, integrity group members, they are saying they are not leaving the party. And I keep quoting Yakubu Mahmoud, the INEC chairman, who says, look, managing internal democracy within political parties is very crucial to the success of political parties. I think that's probably the most intelligent point that has been made by uh, Yakubu Mahmoud since he assumed the office. And we see these political parties not managing their own internal democracy very well. So why would anybody trust a party that cannot manage its own internal processes? This is a big dilemma that Wiki and Co, with their entertainment, their histronics, their, some people call it, uh, their masquerade uh, projections, you know, have put beyond, before the Nigerian electorate. Mm. Now, as for um, Ashwa Jubola Ahmed Chinumbu, uh, campaigning in uh, Benin. Okay, we've seen a lot of activity from the APC presidential candidate in recent times. But I think what is more important, in my view, is the fact that uh, the APC, for the first time, they are beginning to listen to us on this program. When uh, Festus Kiyama was here, the question was posed to him that why is uh, President uh, Mohamed Buhari uh, not uh, campaigning for the APC presidential candidate. He tried to dance around it. He said uh, President Buhari was in Jaws and all of that. But I've seen a press release this morning saying that with effect from January 9, President uh, Buhari will begin to lead the campaign and that he will be uh, in places around the country. I don't know whether I have it here. Adama State on the 9th of January, Yobe on the 10th, Sokoto on the 16th, Kwara on the 17th. Okay, my point when I pose that question to Festus Kiyamo is that you can't say you are chairman of a presidential campaign council, leader of a party, and you don't, you, you don't campaign for your candidate. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so what we hear now is that uh, President uh, Buhari is going to come out and campaign, and it will be interesting to see him and to hear what he has to say. Mm. The other issue is uh, Ashwa Yubola Ahmed Tunubu saying he will uh, rescue Yahoo Yahoo boys and that he will turn them into experts in the manufacturing sector and creation of chips. How does he intend to do that? <laughs> I mean, I don't understand. Yahoo Yahoo boys are criminals. <laughs> so, what I would like to hear from a presidential candidate is that. It would end the Yahoo Yahoo phenomenon and provide jobs and provide, you know, education uh, for these uh, boys who think that they can game the system and cheat everybody. And then, of course, uh, uh, Frank Shaibu, I've seen him saying, Ashwa uh, uh, came up with another blah, 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 uh, statement in uh, Benin. Okay, I don't know. I leave that to. Uh, you know, because that will be a, a trending news. And then he says that uh, President Obasanjo is a blind man, leading the blind, which is endorsement of uh, P2B. Okay, if Obasanjo is a blind man, why go to him in Abekuta to seek his uh, support, to seek his endorsement? So, I mean, the drama continues. We see a lot of contradictions. We see a lot of... Uh, Istronics from the political candidates. I think it's all in the nature of the times and the fact, as I have said previously on this program, that we live in very interesting times. But after March, when the election has been won and lost, I, I hope everybody will drink uh, cold water and just calm down so that this country can move forward. I come here this morning as a very sad man because it's as if we have presidential candidates that don't even understand the severity of the problems. 
The debt management office yesterday said whoever will emerge out of the 18 candidates will have a debt burden of 77 trillion. All of them were the campaign trail. Nobody <clears throat> talked about how they will address the debt burden. It is this kind of thing that saddens me about Nigeria. Then we'll vote in leaders that will take another six months to elect ministers that we all know and will plunge the economy into chaos. I'm a fourth try person, so I'm already looking beyond March and even May 29 because the problems will come. We're campaigning poetry and we govern in prose. We're having the, camp, the poetry of campaign now, but when the prose of governance hits us, which leaders are ready? So please, I will advise all the presidential candidates and their campaign surrogates to please issue statements on how they are going to solve the burden of 77 trillion debts rather than abusing one another. So let me now go to the politics, which I hate talking about, because we've heard it one too much. Politicians are hypocrites. If you don't favor them, they abuse you. They call you bias. They are surrogates who even try to teach us journalists our jobs on TV, like we've seen them in the last week do. Now, Bola Tinubu is saying that Obasanjo is a blind man. This same blind man, he went into a closed-door meeting with Inota. He took Nuhu Ribadu, Baba Kande, and all the stake party stakeholders to go and meet Inota. That's the same blind man, isn't it? The same blind man, the Nation newspaper, wrote glowing things about the week after they visited Ota to see him. There's a tape running around. Sometimes we wish we can play these tapes. Where President Muhammadu Buhari was celebrating the endorsement of blind man Olusha Gwabasanjo in 2015 on CNN. Then, Obasanjo was a national treasure. We all remember how he tore his PDP, or he said he was going to tear his PDP membership. And he supported and endorsed APC then. Then he was not a blind man. Now he's a blind man. Sometimes when politicians speak, <clears throat> I hope Nigerians can read between the lines and ask them the most important problems as regards the debts rather than all the politicking. When I hear words like, uh, we'll turn Yahoo Yahoo boys around, a Yahoo Yahoo boy is not a reflection of the decaying Nigerian economy. It is not a justification for advanced fee fraud. But if we had done better to help these boys provide enabling environments, are we going to have a proliferation of crime? And we had the blank slate under the APC government to be able to do all of this. But did we do it? No. In all of this, I like what he said. He would turn them to chip makers. Pretty much reminds me of, or it's akin to trying to say you would turn people in areas like Oluwole to detectives. There's a chip war going on. And I would be happy if Nigeria can even be part of the chip war, because chips will become the future. So it is time for us to talk more on introspection on development. But give it to him. He pulled out a crowd in Benin. He was able to get that out. A lot of things were said, but he was low on the things he was going to do for Nigeria. And we are not hearing a lot of that in the campaign. The campaigns are just about abusing one another. There are problems on ground. And we should try as much as possible to solve the problem. For Governor Wike and his team, it is obvious that they are in a political coup de sac now. And you can see what happened in the battle. They've plunged Mr. Sheehy Makinde into an abyss of uncertainty. Because you see, we forget too much in this country. And Mr. Sheehy Makinde forgets that for his election to happen in 2019, people had to collapse their structures for him. The likes of Lan Lei, the likes of Chief uh, Ayonride, of the SDP, and a couple of three, four parties endorsed him with the big architecture of his political party, the PDP. But like you said, the structure of the PDP, they are having their own parallel rally and all of that. So it's already in a cul-de-sac. And that's why we keep saying when people fight, they should be able to have a termination date to their fights. They should be able to introspect. But like I keep saying, they might have a political plan we don't know. On the case of President Buhari joining the campaign train, please, I'd like to ask 
What record does President Buhari want to see on the campaign trail when he joins Bola Ahmed Tinubu? What record does he want to campaign on? That's a big pose at this morning. No, it's not about record. It's mm -hmm. about the fact that uh, President Muhammad Buhari has a court following in the northern part of the country. If he joins the uh, uh, Tinubu campaign, he can mobilize, galvanize the northern uh, part of the country the, 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 to support him. The, However, in 1993, yeah. the same northerners did not vote for Tofa. Bashi Tofa lost his uh, election uh, polling unit to Ashwaju Ahmed Chinobo. No, uh, so that's this is MK what MK is MK. I to, to MK, MK Abiola. But, but for that's me, it for me, Dr. Us. Abati, I think the best thing a former president can campaign on is not called following. I think he's on his records. Yeah. So well, if he gets on the campaign trail, it's best he too tells us the records. Okay, That's but, all on news. This is an election that is all about ethnicity and religion and not about the issues. And this is what we've been complaining about on this program on a daily basis. So it's not about theory. It's about real politic. OK? All right. That's all on the news and live. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Michael Wilson, Road to Dury to give us updates on global and Africa business activities. Stay with us. Store or Apple App Store to get started today. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. For Global Business Update, Michael Wilson joins us now from Cape Town, South Africa. Good morning, Michael. 
morning. Uh, Asia Pacific shares up very, very slightly this morning, ending a positive end to the week. Uh, and that's simply because they feel as though they know which way the Fed's going in the United States. Yes, there will be more interest rate rises, but uh, at least there's a degree of certainty, and that seems to be helping stocks uh, in Asia Pacific. Um, and also, the, the job figures out of the United States were quite reasonable yesterday. Of course, it's the big ones um, today. However, uh, the COVID surge is crippling the world's most important factories. That's what. Um, the feeling is about China right now. And also at the ports at Ningbo and Huindao uh, are, um, are experiencing huge congestion, lots of supply chain problems, cancelled and delayed orders and all the rest of it. That's what logistics companies are saying about what's going on uh, in China right now because of the COVID surge. I said yesterday that we should actually take notice of Samsung. Um, their quarterly profits fell to an eight-year low um, simply because of a demand slump. That's what uh, analysts are putting it down to. Uh, profit fell 69% quarter on quarter, year on year. Um, and and this is basically about the lack of semiconductor demand because of a, or felt to be a, a slowing of semiconductor demand because of the ailing uh, global economy. Uh, Taiwan is trying to tap investors. Um, it's very, very encouraged by Elon Musk's Starlink system, which is a low Earth satellite system, and the way it's been used in the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, now, they are obviously gearing up for any potential threats from China and are asking for international, also domestic investors, to start the sort of stage one um, of, their, of their preparation for um, a Taiwan satellite defense and communications network. As far as the United States is concerned, um, futures slightly up ahead of today's jobs figures, but in regular trading, the Dow, Dow, the Dow are down about 300 points, the Nasdaq down about almost two points. Um, it's expected that 200,000 new jobs will be announced that were created last month when the jobs figures come out in the United States today. Um, the, one of the world's um, largest tech companies, Dell, uh, is moving, wants to phase out China chips by 2024 and hoping its suppliers will do the same as well. It's part of this broad-based decoupling that the United States is, um, is, is uh, trying to, to pull off right now away from China. Um, but certainly that's a major company that's saying that by 2024 they'll try to pull out of China chips. Um, the fallout from FTX in the United States continues. This is Silvergate. Now, um, it's, it, and, and the reason I'm quoting this to you is because this is a Federal Reserve registered bank. This is not a fly-by-night operation, and it's really getting worried about how the implosion at FTX is actually affecting the future of cryptocurrencies in a more regulated system. This is what, and they, they've seen $8.1 billion pulled from investment in cryptos over the past year. Um, as far as the UK is concerned, a slight softening as far as the strikes are concerned. Um, the, the, there is legislation um, which is, is expected to come up against a huge amount of opposition in the House of Lords. But nevertheless, here it is that employers could be suing unions. Um, but if, if for, for, for lack of business and, and, all, and all the rest of the damage it may cause to the UK economy during those strikes. But it appears as though the government has slightly moved away from um, increasing uh, the threshold for strike ballots. In other words, um, it's got... It's got what the government was wanting was a higher proportion of people actually being seen to vote for strike. Um, the, the doubling the notice from two weeks to a month of industrial action, that is now out of the question. And also um, the, the, the fact that ambulance drivers were going to be banned from striking, that's no longer in there. And it is reported, and I can put it unfortunately no stronger than that, that nurses are now saying that they are happy, or at least the RCM, the Royal College of Nurses, is saying it, it would be, it would settle for 10% rather than the 19% that they've been demanding. So a slight softening as far as the strike situation in the UK is concerned. Um, finally, to commodities and oil and gold. Oil, first of all, um, no rebound there, really. Um, and demand internationally is falling. The Saudis have apparently slashed their prices of oil. So short-term crude won't be um, ramping up to... to uh, to, to, the, to the sort of levels that were possible yesterday. And gold appears to 
have found a barrier at around about $1,900 um, an ounce. It could be up to 3000 That is the prediction for it. And all that's based on rising inflation and falling trust of um, international markets and all the rest of it, which makes gold the, the sort of traditional safe haven. But so far, it appears to have found a barrier at around about $1,900 an ounce. That is the global view this morning. Right, let's go back to the softening of things in the UK, but it's not moving anything. The strikes are still on, even in the railway sector and all of that. And there are indications that that will have a big blow for the British economy. So what is Rishi Sunak doing, even with the softening, with yeah, concessions here and there? But nothing is still happening. No, I, th I think you're right. I think it will have an effect on the economy. Of course it will. But what, what I'm saying is that it does look as though the government's you know, sitting in stand, that they were actually pulling up the, the drawbridge, as it were, and saying, you know, no more discussion. Now they're, they're slightly, as, as all politicians do, slightly softening their stance for those, for those, for, for those particular parts of, of the legislation. But they are particularly worried, um, I think, that the, because um, the, the only very, very small parts of that were actually in the Conservative Party manifesto in 2019 at the time of the general election. Um, it, it's felt that it will have a very thorny passage through the House of Lords. It might not make it. So hence um, a bit of softening. But I think the big one, if it's true, is that the Royal College of Nurses, which is a public, obviously a public sector union, um, and now appears to be settling for lower than the 19% that they've gone in for and would uh, maybe, maybe, just maybe accept 10%. But again, a lot of discussions have to take place. As far as the railways are concerned, I mean, as the strike grinds on, I suspect they will find less and less sympathy from the public. But that again will be a public, that will be, sorry, a, a political decision. And, and I mean, I, I suspect that the, 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 the two sides may be getting together in the relatively near future. But that, that's as far as we go. But damage to the economy, of course. I still on, still on the UK and based on the legislation, analysts have said that if you look at Europe, minimum civil service levels haven't quite worked. They haven't been enacted because they just don't work. Because what this means is that rather than striking nationally, perhaps they then take their strikes locally. So unions might not really be affected by this by this new legislation. What's your take on that? Uh, well, I, all, all I can repeat is what I said. That it looks as though um, there is a slight softening uh, on, on the threshold for strike ballots, which means that um, it, was, it was going to be a much higher proportion of the unionised workforce to have to prove that they actually had voted um, for a strike. Now, that, that, that seems to be moving away. And also that the notice for industrial action appears to be... Um, was, it's now two weeks. What they what the government wanted was to make it a month, but now they're back to two weeks again. So I think what, what we're seeing is a, a slight softening. But the fact of the matter is that whichever way you play this, the economy simply cannot afford um, much more in terms of public sector pay because it, 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 they, 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 they pay tax on it, but they're not creating tax by being in private business. It's as simple as that. It happens with public services throughout the world. Uh, as, as I think the doctor was saying yesterday, you know, long on promise, short on fact. Well, uh, uh, Mike, I'm not too sure that I agree with you that the uh, UK government, Rishi Sunak in particular, is uh, softening up on uh, the uh, unions. The legislation that is being proposed looks like a hardening of position because what they're saying is that, look, uh, workers in the rail, uh, health, and uh, other unions must provide a minimum level of service. And if they don't provide that minimum level, then they are open to sanctions. And in fact, they could be sacked by their bosses. That doesn't look like softening to me. It looks like an anti-labor uh, legislation uh, being proposed by the UK. But that's not the one I want to talk about. I want to talk about the U.S., where the Federal Trade Commission now has come up with a, an anti- or rather non-compete proposal, clauses, saying that if you work for company A, you cannot leave company A and go and work for company B. And that has been, of course, uh, you know, uh, opposed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, saying that this is unlawful, this is illegal, and that they will challenge it. But from the point of view of labor relations, what do you think of this proposal 
by the Federal Trade Commission in the United States. And secondly, in, the, uh, in Turkey, Turkey is now saying, oh, inflation is, no, is now uh, lower than 84.4 percent. They say it's down uh, Tuesday, according to official data. And the argument is that this is due to base effect. What is this base effect? This base effect could it be Erdogan, President uh, Recep Erdogan, looking for a second term. Because alternative uh, agencies have said, in fact, inflation in Turkey is over 137 percent. So is this politics or economics? Uh, Turkey is a mystery, I think, to most economists that try to look at it. And uh, the way that their government treats inflation is, is something which um, I mean, what, what, what can I tell you? It's not the way that central banks around the world actually deal with it. Um, so I think we're into the realm of politics and I think we're into the realms of crowd pleasing and the, and the president there is not unaware naturally of the fact that uh, general elections loom later in 2023. So of course, um, he's giving as much as he can. He's been trying to increase the, 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 the minimum wage in, in Turkey. Um, and, and if it works, it works, but it will only be temporary. Nothing, there is no magic money tree there. And, and how they manage to run an economy um, by lowering interest rates in, each time inflation actually happens defeats me because if you if you just go up to the man in the street and say do you know what this is doing to your savings and he or she says uh, no i don't then I, I'm, it's pretty obvious isn't it that high inflation um, you, you mentioned 83 percent i've seen figures of 88 percent and that that's just the average i mean that doesn't that doesn't account for food which is much much higher than that and that's what the, the majority of, of poorer people spend the majority of their income on so i i, I really don't see um how it works um as far as uh, the uk is concerned yes I, I understand what you're saying what i'm trying to say is that um i, I think that the uh, part of part of what Sunak wants to do has in fact been softened very, very slightly by these particular vetoes that I've just been talking about. But generally speaking, it, it is it is quite a, a big take on the unions. But remember, as I keep saying, it has to get through the House of Lords before it becomes law. And I think it's gonna, it'll, it'll be a fairly um, rough, rough passage. OK, thank you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. Now for business updates across the African continent. Rotus Odiri joins us. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, Rafai. And good, good morning, morning to all our morning, viewers okay. out there. Well, what's, what else is going on here across Africa apart from debt and slimming down governments? Uh, and your own side reports. I asked, uh, I thought about you three when I spoke with an uh, exclusive chat with Ben Akabu, the Director General of the Budget Office. So I asked for his thoughts, and he aligned with you guys. Let's take a listen. Absolutely. We, we um, you know, in the Ministry of Finance, Budget and Schnappen, have remained fully supportive of implementation of the yeah, Ransai, um, you know, report. Yeah. And um, uh, there's ongoing work, you know, in that regard. It's mm. taken, I mean, you know, it's taken on the different shades of views, about, you know, about that. But we think that it's needful and it's, it, it aligns with this. this the, the, the point about the Ronsai's report is not, you know, some people interpret it as cutting and chopping and laying off staff. Right. No, what are you talking I mean, about? That club, you know, so I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, okay. Is that look, there are agencies that seem to have, you know, duplicated, you know, mandates. Mm. So you collapse them, merge mm. them. Of course, you'll have some savings. But those savings are likely to be at the level of folks like me. You know the top, the DGs. If you if you, you collapse, you know uh, three agencies into one, mm. two CEOs have no jobs. Right. But right. the rest of the people mm. may have jobs. Just we've seen uh, recently with the implementation of the PIA. Okay, we saw the you know former PPPRA mm -hmm. and um, you know the former Petroleum Equalization Fund yep. and the downstream. Uh, you know, uh, sections of DPR mm. come together right. into a new a single agency right. called, uh, the, you know, the ND MPRA. Yeah. But it didn't result in loss of jobs. jobs. If anything, <laughs> they, they added mm. numbers. You know, so that's the kind of thing to, to assume that merging agencies necessarily. Mm. 
will result in a massive saving of numbers isn't really. How do you slim? You know, there's lots of uh, New Year's resolutions this year. People want to lose weight and so on and so forth. So how, do you, how, does, how does the federal government lose weight? How do you slim down uh, the bloated government? How do you reduce our personnel costs, which are... What's our personnel cost for 2023 in the budget? I think five trillion is what is the is the is the estimates, um, including government-owned agencies, pensions, and MDAs, which is almost as much as our debt service, which is just it's it's an astounding figure, um, and it's something that of course um, the those who seek to be leaders of the nation. Next month, uh, but you know, we'll have to tackle as well is the is the size of government. But again, we've talked about this ad nauseum. Um, uh, Mr. Sorry, um, again, I was very much looking forward to him to talking with you three, and I thought it was very interesting when Rufai asked him about the seventy-seven uh, estimated. I think isn't the figure sixty-six? Anyway, seventy-seven trillion naira debt waiting for the new administration. Him saying that he would he would pause. Um, debt repayments until an audit is, is, is carried out. We say debt is on ground for we you. Have, you know, I'm in, I'm, I have I'm simple, it. so for as president, I'm going to pause repayment of debt until I audit the debts. That's what I'll do first and foremost when I'm sworn in. I'm not repaying any debt until the audits are properly done. And because we need the money to fix the country. But, you know, Buhari has borrowed Nigeria back to the Stone Age. Everybody has agreed on that. But our problem is not debt to GDP ratio. Our problem is debt to re I mean debt to revenue uh, ratio, and the revenue will aggressively increase. You know when we get comfortable. Oh. Well, you know we have set. I've discussed this several times, including on these shows, and I've identified several other revenue sources that either have been hidden or have been are not been harnessed the way they should be. I've identified taxes that are owed to Nigerian uh, states. That's up to about 4.5 billion. I said this on the Arise TV by oil companies, and you can. Those are low-hanging fruits. We have identified about 11 trillion naira of revenue-generating government agencies that are not remitted to the federal government post. You know, yes, we have identified monies that could come from the uh, NL, uh, NLNG, the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Company. That's over. Five billion dollars that is not remitted directly to the federal, it's remitted through the NMPC, and the NMPC just quaff the money. So I've identified several other products that can get into the international market at this time, including you know, products like sorghum, you know, there are a lot of mineral resources that have been. Uh, but, you know, sold under the table that we have identified, like it brought into uh, the official and formal uh, processes. That will give you a lot of money. This is now the third time we've heard about mineral resources uh, in, the, in, in five days this week. Anyway, if you pause repayments on debt, you default. So let's just uh, you know, put that into perspective. You, you can't pause your repayments to, to carry out uh, an audit, because if you do that, you'll, you'll default on your debt, and then there will be all types of problems. But uh, Mr. Soro, it's always you know, hearing from him and his plans for, for government if he was to take power, always very, very interesting. But I hope you guys please continue to pose these questions to every one of these candidates that come aboard. Finally, Kenya. Um, Mr. John Ngumi, he was the chair of Safaricom about five or six months ago. He was just appointed, and he's leaving. He's, he's out. There was a board shakeup, and uh, he says that he is going to focus on green energy projects, which is, which is so interesting. After just five months in power, excuse me, at the, well, yeah, at the top, at the helm of the, one of the largest uh, telco com communication, telco firms, on the African continent, it says you want to focus on green energy. Yeah, okay. The, the, the word on the streets is that um, he is, of course, uh, a Kenyatta ally, uh, a big supporter of the former president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta. He was placed on the boards of some very cash-rich uh, parastatals in Kenya. And now that there's a new government, uh, Safaricom is aligning. So what they've done is they're seeking to um, be partner with the Ruto administration in order to uh, be 
involved in some loan distribution programs and fertilizer distribution programs and a number of other things. So I believe the, the folks at Safaricom said, well, um, you know, probably not a good idea to have the b best friend of the man who, who was, uh, yeah, of the man who was running against, uh, or rather who Kenyatta didn't support or who wasn't uh, behind Ruto. Uh, so yeah, so that's very interesting with Safaricom. They're also looking, I think they're, they're still, they've still got some expansion plans as far as Ethiopia and some other African nations on the content. So I mean, that's I mean, our update. I mean, that's what you get, you know, and that's the mix between big business and government. Yep. It has to be said. Yep. The former CEO of Safaricom, of blessed memory, uh, Bob Collins, the mall, yeah. was a big friend of, you know, Uhuru Kenyatta too, mm. and he gave Safaricom a lot of leeway, you know, they've been able to expand. But apart from that, he was giving Safaricom, they've been able to build a good business over oh, the years. Course, yeah. You know, it's not, I, 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 I smirk a bit when people call Safaricom just a telecom company. Mm. It's a, one of the biggest finance companies out of Kenya. It's one of the biggest energy companies in Africa with M Copper and a couple yep, of other yep, things yep. They, they, they've done. So if they're diversifying and they're kicking out because of Safaricom, I mean, it's all right. Two things I'd like to say. Number one, as regards the debt issue, mm. yes, there needs to be an audit, even on how the debt was spent, but by the provision of the budget, the debt repayment will have to continue of while course. the audit goes on. Yeah, of course. And let me quickly tell you some audits that I've seen mm. as regards even how the money was spent. It's the $100 million, and I keep talking about it because I feel so unhappy about it. Yeah. The new terminal built, yeah, such a airport. sweet terminal. Yeah. It can't be used because of structural defects. Mm, yeah. That's the audit. As much as many other prayers, because that deal was, I think it was four airports we did terminals for. I think we did Port Harcourt, Enugu, and the likes. Yeah. It was 500 million from China Exim, mm. predominantly the funding from them. But you can see we are not even using one of them. Yeah. And we're not even getting the money to be able to pay back. So that and a litany of many other projects mm like Mambilla and the likes of some other projects. We should look up. You see, because when you look at the dead stock, when you go to dmo.gov.ng and you look at the dead stock, when you see a couple of these projects, you're like, okay, what's the cost-benefit analysis yeah, of the, of the project? Projects. And you don't see too many of them. Okay, I saw one with Galaxy Backbone and all of that. Till date, you still have government agencies using at yahoo.com. Mm. The .gov.ng, people will not use it. So what's the cost-benefit analysis of all of this project? Because, you see, for money to be siphoned, it has to be plowed into a project. And those are the audits we need to do. Well said. Oh, I yeah, agree. I was just going to say, uh, right on that, in terms of the audits, of course, when, when um, Shore came here yesterday, he would make lofty promises that perhaps are not workable. And um, also, in terms of the economics of that, I have to admit that I believe that he, he wasn't quite prepared to respond to that. They just released the figures the day before and saying that he would halt um, repayment, repayment of loans. Yeah. That's not really, that's not, yeah. he can't do that. So <laughs> that's not realistic. But um, going back to what um, he said and, uh, and streamlining the government, even based on the Warren Sire report and what um, the, and I, I, Mr. Ben Akaboize said from the DG, um, DG of the Budget Office that they started the process, however, they've not been able to. Still, it, it will be quite difficult because of the structure and makeup, right. and then. Um, putting it into, you know, um, actually implementing it, very difficult. However, there must be a push for this because if we're going to, um, we're going to cut government spending, it has to be critical mm. to implement that report. Without, as um, to reassure Nigerians, it's not that you, people are going to lose jobs, they're going to be, there's going to be a massive job cut because we also know the impact of, of that on, on employment figures. However, in, term, in terms of catching out the ghost workers, in, in terms of slimming out, like um, Rafai said yesterday, those who are you know, clocking in every day, but not doing anything at mm. all in the offices. That has to be streamlined, absolutely. Okay, Rotus, yesterday you posed a question uh, that we should ask, uh, what's his name? Mr. Sore. 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 I asked Omoyele Sore pointedly that Rotus had posed this question. And he said he was going to audit, you know, the debt, uh, even if Zenabamad had said that, uh, oh, She's not going to restructure the debt and all of that. And he said, it will audit. OK, the audit is important mm. in the interest of uh, transparency and accountability, particularly with regard to ways and means. Yes. OK, over 22.7 trillion, trillion yeah. that uh, Nigerians would pay up to 40 years, that they now say they will securitize and reduce, according to patients Uniha mm. of the DMO, you know, uh, the interest rate from 18.5% to 
8.5%, yeah. 8 yeah. 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 9%, you know, if you round it up. So, yeah, that's his own view. But is it something that he can do? Mm. Will he become Nigeria's president? However, what is signposted is that that's an issue that all of us have to talk about. Yep. A debt of uh, 77 trillion naira, you know, for the incoming government, uh, that's a serious matter. Very serious. It mm. means that, as I pointed out on this program, that the next government is inheriting an empty treasury. Mm. The second point that you raise with regard to uh, Ben Akabuizi, uh, this is a case of unnecessary familiarity breeding <laughs> contempt. Mm. Because yesterday, when I told you about the Onosaye report, mm. you were arguing with me. Mm. And I said the objective is not about job losses. Now, uh, Ben Akabuizi said the same thing. You are putting him on. Uh, uh, ben oh, Akabuizi, so yes, hold on, yes, hold on. Yes. Ben Akabuizi was a commissioner in mm. Lagos. At the time, I had a ringside seat in the Federal Executive Council of this country. Mm. And I was there. I was part of the process. There are many other things I can tell you about that report, which I may not say on television. OK? So I mean, so you now come, uh, you say, oh, uh, Kabuizi is confirming what you said there. Yeah, he's aligning with yesterday. you. Yesterday. Yeah. Yes, that's not, what you said. Yes. Uh, yeah, but when I uh, told you, you were arguing with me. This is not a program for arguments. Yes. It's about conversation. Mm. I don't do Google, uh, internet. I speak from exposure and experience. Right. However, my final point on this program today is to ask you, mm. we haven't seen the new Naira notes. <laughs> Everybody is uh, complaining. Uh, ATMs are still dispensing old Naira notes. Mm. So where is the CBN? Right. Where are the banks? What do you think is responsible? In fact, where is the CBN governor? Mm. So to re respond to your prior point, I still maintain that the Oronsayan report has does not been implemented for a reason. And the reason is that it is difficult to try to implement the change. So whether it's Ben Akabweze, and he was an exclusive interview, which is why I put that here, simply saying that he agreed with you. But I don't agree with you, and I still don't agree with him. The, it is difficult to try to streamline these things, and that is the reason why it has not happened. So let's see whether a new government is able to do it. Let's see who can. But it is incredibly, incredibly tough. You heard what he said about the number of total employees that we have. And even if you try to realign agencies here and there, your cost savings are still not going to be that much. That was another key thing that he said. So that debate is still very much on the table. So whether it's him, whether it's the president, whether it's you three, I still do not agree. And that is validated by the fact that the Oronsai report, after how many years, has not been implemented. On the new Naira notes, I use, I'm cashless. So I suggest everybody go cashless and not worry about any notes. <laughs> everybody go cashless. cashless. NFIU. Yeah, the new the financial um, institute. No uh, cash withdrawal for government. They are also agency. say they support a cashless uh, a you know, yeah. policy. Yeah. But how they are going to uh, impose that is another issue. Yeah. Of course. Because of course. I looked at, the, at their details and I say, well, you may quote the law, but has anybody ever followed that law? Oh, that's and they question. are given a deadline mm -hmm. of March 3. Amen. So, so we have to pay attention to mm. the details yeah. and stay away from what they say on their Twitter and uh, Google <laughs> and Internet and try to, you know, interrogate issues wow. more deeply. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank we'll you take so a much. short break now. And when we return, we'll be talking to Paul Alaji, a Nigerian economist. Stay with us. We'll be right back. to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. Take your business to its zenith. 
Zenith Bank. In your best interest. I'm about to serve better breakfast. If you're in Lagos, you need to see this. I'm not just streaming content, I'm just escaping traffic. Get more data to enjoy exclusive content. Dial star 141 hash now. Airtel, the smartphone oh. network. My brother, my sister, do you know that winning an election is not only about getting the majority vote? For that, your candidate to be declared winner of the election, he or she must secure 25% of the vote in two-thirds of all states, plus the FCT to be president, and 25% of the vote in two-thirds of all local governments of a state to be governor. This is constitutional, and every presidential candidate has had to pass this threshold. Even governors have had to make this mark to get elected in their States. We live in one country with different languages, religions, and ethnic groups. This is why it is not enough to have only northern votes, or southern votes, or eastern votes, or western votes. The only way to get elected as president or governor is by gaining enough support across the country and states. Let us make sure that we know now so that we don't cause an issue tomorrow. This message is brought to you by the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. Set to take the African continent and the world by storm. They are giants in every sense of the word, and they will bring entertainment that's just as big. Don't miss the first ever season of Big Brother Titans with two African giants, Naija and Nsamse, on the biggest roof together. Big Brother Titans starts on Sunday, 15th of January, on DSTV 198, Go TV 29, and African Magic. Headline sponsor, Bamboo, Flutterwave, and Lotus Star. The National Pension Commission, PENCOM, is pleased to inform all its stakeholders, particularly retirees of Treasury-funded ministries, departments, and agencies who retired in the year 2022, that the federal government has released the sum of 13.89 billion naira for the payment of their accrued pension rights. The accrued pension rights represent an employee's benefit for the past years of service up to June 2004 when the CPS came into effect. Accordingly, PENCOM is processing remittances into the various retirement savings accounts of the affected retirees and their pension fund administrators will notify them in due course. Finally, PENCOM appreciates the efforts of His Excellency, Mr. President, for his untiring support and commitment to the implementation of the CPS and ensuring the welfare of retirees. Signed, Management. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. The rising debt in Nigeria is a major concern. As the country's total debt figure will jump, as we've been told, to 77 trillion naira, if the National Assembly reconsiders President Muhammad Buhari's request for 22.7 trillion naira ways and means loan, the federal government revealed that the incoming administration will inherit about 77 trillion naira debt by the time President Mohamed Buhari's tenure ends in May. Director General of the Debt Management Office, DMO, Patience Sunia, disclosed this in Abuja while fielding questions from journalists at a public presentation and breakdown of the highlights of the 2023 
Appropriation Act. Although data released by the DMO had put Nigeria's public debt at 44.06 Naira trillion as a third quarter of 2022, the federal government plans to further borrow to finance its supplementary budget as well as the 2023 budget. Joining us on this show right now to discuss Nigeria's rising debt profile is Paul Alaji, the Nigerian economist. Welcome to the morning show, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, very quickly. Yeah, good morning and thank you so very much for having me. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, uh, the introduction repeated a point made by uh, Patient Sunia of the Debt Management Office that Nigeria has the prospect of a 77 trillion naira debt profile. What uh, do you think are the implications for whoever becomes president of Nigeria by May 29, 2023? An empty treasury, a difficult economic situation, or, well, what else? Well, the challenges are ahead uh, for the next president starting May 29, 2023 are enormous. It's beyond having empty treasury. It's beyond having over 77 trillion. What many may not know is that there is no even plan to boost revenue from 2023, 2024. And if we continue to borrow at this rate, by Q4 2025, our debt profile would have increased to 100 trillion naira because we don't have something significant to boost revenue. It does not mean that with our population, we cannot generate up to 20 trillion naira for federal government alone. Of course we can. Of course we have. But are these monies getting to the treasury of government? It's another question entirely. What seems to be certain is that what we are spending even the little, the monies we are borrowing on, on are a lot of concerns. 2023 budget you mentioned, doctor, reveals that government will spend 5 trillion naira, exactly the figure submitted by President Buhari and signed by him was 4.99 trillion naira, is what it will spend on personnel for government workers, which I think is necessary. But even though we need to do a lot about or Orosai report, as mentioned by Mr. Kabwezi, but I see if that were not enough, we will spend over 6 trillion naira. 6 trillion naira not to pay back our debt, 6 trillion naira just to service our debt. The Minister of Finance has revealed that of all one naira we generated in 2022, 80 kobo of all one naira was spent to service debt, not to pay them back. What did we use to pay uh, salaries? What did we even use to finance Mr. President trip? What did we give members of National Assembly each time they sit in their chambers? What did we give them? Most of the monies are borrowed. And for the first time in history, in that 2023 budget, we will now be spending more money to service than the, compared to the amount of money we will spend on capital expenditure. Anybody going around to campaign and is throwing up his babariga, I think I say pity to such person because the task ahead is enormous. And I will tell you why I said it's enormous. When you borrow so much and you have a central bank that is also devaluing, it means your debt profile will keep increasing. And I will quickly show you the relationship. Each time we devalue our currency, all the monies we borrowed from outside Nigeria automatically will increase in volume. 2021, specifically, around February or March, during Q1, when Central Bank of Nigeria devalued uh, Naira, what we saw was that one trillion Naira had to attempt a debt profile. When you investigate the debt profile, as Mr. Shawore have said, it will discover that significant amount, not all, of the monies we are borrowing was a result of devaluation. And that is why economics keep, say, keep saying that when it comes to the issue of economy, you cannot undo them, a, a issue of economy separately. You have to take an holistic 
approach to this issue. Then when you keep borrowing and your value, the value of your currency keeps going down, and most of the monies you are borrowing, just as we have submitted again for 2023 budget, are coming for internal debt, from internal debt, that is internal sources. What you are telling the labor market is that prepare for a higher unemployment figure already. Unemployment is above 33%. Youth unemployment is even higher than that. But with the recent budget, the recent debt profile, we are saying that, hold on, this is not enough. You are going to witness higher unemployment figure in the coming period. Thank you very much, Mr. Alaje. So the World Bank has said that Nigeria's debt um, service um, co um, cost to revenue ratio could rise to 160% by 2027, except broad-based reforms are, are implemented to unfreeze the you know, uh, fiscal policy. I'd like to get your take on some of the reforms that ought to be done, particularly with regards to our revenue, revenue cost. We are borrowing over 10 trillion, over 11 trillion. Uh, some of the monies we borrow, 3.3 trillion, will be given to those who are, pro who are buying oil for us in the name of subsidy. The money is not coming directly to the economy. Over 3 trillion is going into that. Of the same amount we are borrowing, we are going to be spending over 6 trillion. So the money we borrowed is for what exactly? To pay subsidy and the remainder to pay. Uh, to service debt. So World Bank and IMF, have, um, even different international organizations have been speaking to Nigerian government. Q4, World Bank had written to Nigeria government to say, you need to make choice. I spoke with uh, one of your colleagues, your correspondent of business, uh, uh, Mr. Bosin or Morfai. We had a lengthy discussion on this, that Nigeria need to make a choice. Unfortunately, the foundation, the fundamental for the choices, as recommended by World Bank, UNDP, IMF, they are not made today. What many Nigerians are after is what will happen to the next election. What we don't know is that this budget, even before the next election uh, comes to play, and we're going to wait for another three months to four months for the next leader to get to office. We don't even know who we come. So the reforms are very clear. First of all, we need to do something about subsidy. We need to do something about value of Naira. We need to make policy about insecurity so that food uh, uh, inflation will significantly reduce. Unfortunately, not so much is said about food security, not so much is said about empowering the private sector, especially manufacturing sector, for a population as ours. Any country you see, a country with the largest population, what you see is that such economy try to improve manufacturing. I will give you an example. United States is the largest in America. Brazil is the largest in South America. Uh, Germany is the largest in western part of Europe. And Russia is, a, is the largest in uh, eastern part of Europe. Nigeria is that of Africa. China is the entire Asia. What are these countries doing that we are not doing? Their manufacturing component, they deliberately grew them to above 30%. And the real standard we should have is about 40%. But when you talk of manufacturing, what is the manufacturing component? I mean, what is the uh, GDP, manufacturing component of our GDP? Today, when manufacturers want to assess FX, myself inclusive, when you want to assess FX from Central Bank, you, hardly, you may even wait forever. We are forced to go to the parallel market to source your FX. And you wonder why demand is growing in the parallel market to import equipment into the country so that you can get some people employed. I'm afraid until we have holistic, first of all, our selection process of those that are leading us must not be based on who is popular, who has a religion. Because of course, at the end of the day, your hunger is not going to lose. Hunger is not going to consider whether you are popular or not. When you have your unemployment grow to about 40%, which is the prediction, and you have the uh, Naira uh, rate going to about 500 Naira artificial market, be waiting for over 800 Naira uh, parallel market. A lot are waiting for us in this year because if you, when you even look at IMF projection of the one third of the, uh, of the world going into a, a, a recession, even though they, they, they projected positive growth for Nigeria, but that positive growth you need to compare to what our population growth is saying. So you know that we have a lot in our, with, in our hand. It's not time for anybody to go to campaign rally and be dancing. It's for the person to discuss real issues with us. What are you going to do a by issue of debt? Because it's a big stone that is on our throat. We can't swallow it. We can't permit it. We need a surgeon to remove it from our throat so that our economy can be free right, right now. Good, good to see you, my, my friend and brother, Paul Alaje, once again. And a happy new year to you. Uh, so how do, we, how do we grow dollar revenue? How do we grow naira revenue? What's the role of subsidies? I mean, those three insights. 
Well, we have a lot to do with revenue. And I must tell you that revenue is not rocket science. It's just that we are not ready to generate them. I must also put a caveat in a conversation with a state governor. He had mentioned to me that he has commissioned a, an agency to start collecting revenue from some Okada rider and so on and so forth. I smiled and I said, Mr. Governor, I don't think that's the right way to go. Because when you look at people that are poor, as at that time, people living in multidimensional poverty, according to UNDP, were over 80 million people. The recent report is now over 130 million million people. Uh, and I said, those are not the people to tax. In fact, you need to have a program to support those people. But who do you tax? Not my figures. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, there are agencies, I mean, there are sectors in Nigeria that even when we were in COVID, they were growing in leap and bound. Unfortunately, the revenue that went to FRS and different states and different places they are supposed to pay revenue and charges, money that went to government was reducing. In fact, government was even pampering these uh, sectors that because of COVID, they were given palliative. Meanwhile, most common men on the streets of Nigeria were not given palliative. That's where our money are. One of them alone declared trillions and trillions of Naira in revenue. But I wonder why government is not making so much of money. And we have not one, not two, not two, not in tens. We have them in Nigeria. And I can tell you that revenue collection is not rocket science. It's just that we are not ready to collect the money where they belong. Okay, uh, Mr. Laji, you are talking about revenue. I like your comments on the finance bill, which the uh, Minister of Finance says will be signed in four days. One day or uh, two days already gone, and that finance bill has not been uh, signed. But it's a very problematic uh, bill. How do you have an appropriation act without a finance act, which is supposed to address the issue of revenue? And stakeholders have said too many contradictions there. And then second, Patience Unia, the DG of uh, DMO, their management office, is telling us that uh, the National Assembly should uh, pass, approve the securitization of the ways and means for 40 years because that will reduce the interest rate from 18.5% to 8.5%. What are your thoughts on these two issues? Well, uh, we should know that even if the National Assembly passes that, we are still holding the money. You know, I made comment in 2017 and 2018 on, on, on your television station and another television station. I said, the strategy of government may be how to reschedule, how to reschedule, and how to uh, seek debt forgiveness. In 2019, that dominated some headlines. The truth is that most of our debts today are not what can be canceled because they are commercial. Here, a presidential candidate has said they will pause. <laughs> the truth is that we will be faced with stiff sanctions across the world, especially if you don't pay uh, your commercial loans. It's not, it's not going to be funny. Nigeria may be faced with sanctions. So for, for restructuring of ways and means, Nigeria needs to know what that means. When there are a gap between government receipts and uh, government expenses, it may approach the central bank for such advances to be given. And respons the responsible thing government should do is as soon as the receipt you projected comes in, that's the revenue you are projecting comes in, you are projecting comes in for you to collect such money, it should be paid back. But what we have seen with this new revelation, which is completely new to some of us, is that some of those money when they came, they were not even enough to meet government responsibility. So should we reschedule? If we don't reschedule, government will further be repressed. And uh, the National Assembly, we also want to get, we need to get commitment from the federal government. How would you repay back? You see, we want it to be at 8%. And we have not done something significant about making more revenue. And I said when 2022 budget was uh, presented and signed by the president uh, that we are going to generate, was it 8 trillion naira? We saw during, uh, at the end of President Buhari's administration, we did not generate up to 8, 8 trillion naira. Rather, the government went back to National Assembly to borrow over 800 billion naira uh, in the name of supplementary budget. And I can 
can tell you 2023 budget, uh, we don't know who we, who we emerge as president, but if it's the same attitude to revenue, the same attitude to expenditure, I tell you, we may even go back to, uh, to ask for more supplementary budget, and we might be saying that it should be 100% financed uh, by debt. So the way I means could be restructured uh, to give that leeway. But the question that many Nigerians have and many economists have is the issue of trust about the proper management of the economy of Nigeria, proper management of Nigerian finances, and hoping that uh, even when this is restructured, are we sure that we will not get into another uh, bottleneck? When you look at numbers, what was our debt in 2015? What is our debt today? By what percentage has it grown? Are we sure that when we reschedule and say uh, 40 years, we are going to uh, be we are going to be coming out? And what, why do we want to? So me, it's, a, it's, it's as if we are kicking the can down the street and we are waiting for the future for us to have the miracle of some sort and that by that we'll be able to pay 8%. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why even the 8% if we say we'll pay today, I can tell you in a, ma in a matter of three to four years, it will be too much for Nigeria to pay. And the, the, the evidence are there for us to say that in the next three to four years, even the 8% will be very bodysome for us to pay in the coming period. All right, still on revenue, let's talk about that because you talk about company income tax as one of the drivers in terms of revenue. However, the employers in Nigeria are complaining of the multiple taxation, saying that it could actually mean that smaller businesses in Nigeria would close shop come 2023 if the Finance Act of, or Finance Bill of 2022 is assented to by the president. In view of this, or in line with this, what's your alternative um, recommendation based on the fact that multiple tax taxation has the double edge of, yes, increasing revenue for the government, but also posing a threat to companies in Nigeria, particularly small businesses. Okay, so let me first uh, clarify what I, I said the last time. I did not mean CIT. I was not referring to comp uh, company income tax. There are revenues that should go to government for organization that are returning revenue in trillion. Yes, I said in trillions in Nigeria. As a revenue person, uh, somebody who play in the field, I can tell you that uh, there are several handshakes between those to, that are supposed to collect and those that are supposed to pay. Unfortunately, the Nigerian people and Nigerian government are to change in the process. That is why you are not seeing the kind of revenue both the federal government and the state government especially. I give you an instance. Uh, we approach a state government for revenue generation and the organization to pay what belongs to that state. We've already spoken with them even before approaching the state. Uh, so some of four billion that was supposed to go to the state in revenue. But when we approach the state, the head of uh, revenue, uh, internal revenue, had uh, called some of the, uh, some of the assistant of the state governor. And the assistant to the state governor said, don't worry, we are going to collect this money themselves. Only for us to discover that some envelopes and some bags are exchanged hands. That is why the state governor, till today, the state is still ravaging in poverty. When the poverty report was published, the state was, was of course, among those uh, that that was listed among poor people. Four trillion, four billion naira may not be a big deal for a state, but I tell you, it can help alleviate some level of poverty. And that is a say, imagine what should be going to federal government from these different organizations. So, but I can give you my word. See, I mean, not less than 20 trillion naira. Our budget is uh, 20, uh, 21 trillion. But what you come in revenue for that budget is not less than 20 trillion naira. And I don't mean that you will need to break the bank or you need to borrow any money. But you see, revenue work is not done with like a dasical attitude. It's not done when you, are, when you are waiting that revenue will come. You have to go to the field. That is how it's done anywhere in the world. And if you are tired of going to the field, you need to create system and structure that people will naturally come and pay revenue. If not, there are stopping blocks ahead. You spoke about the issue of uh, multiple taxation. Uh, and I tell you the truth, indeed there, is, there are a lot of issues around multiple taxation because the easy way out is what different levels of government are looking at. For instance, somebody has paid for signages 
to authority in Abuja, uh, which of course is the Department of uh, Outdoor Advertising. But the local government in Abuja, haven't had agreement with the same organization, goes to the uh, poor shop owner and locks the shop or pays the car on the shop and say the same person should pay for the same thing. Eventually, how will the person push the cost? He puts it on product and you see the price is going up. When that repeats itself for multiple people uh, who are buying, then you, when uh, the Bureau of Statistics surveys them for to know what inflation figures are saying or asks for how much they are selling their product, you see inflation going up. So taxes could actually induce in a way what the prices of commodity would be, especially when the uh, when the number of people that are buying because of that pressure is, is, in, is increasing. It will surely show in, in the numbers. So for us, I, I strongly believe that the, uh, the issue of multiple taxation is real. I have been victim of uh, multiple taxation for some agencies of government, our organization have been, and a lot of Nigeria indeed. But we are saying that there are fresh money or there are monies that we are collecting we are not collecting enough and there are a lot of exchanges going behind the curtain that the federal government and state government need to do something about and i hope that during the meeting at national economic council government and representative of nigerian people will be very serious about generating more revenue okay. to bring our people out of poverty because when you say you bring them out of poverty by central bank advancing money to government and also borrowing excessively the impact is going to be on inflation okay. the impact is going to be on poverty. Okay, the impact is going to be on employment. Paul, if you can hear me. I mean, I mean if you can hear me, straight on the bat, you're, you're spot on. I mean, I can even tell you one that can fund our budget as we speak today. You can get 30 trillion as we speak today from dead capital. If you whip up dead capital yes. of real estate, the government owns 30 trillion a city. Now, these are empirical arguments that have been made. That's one. Let's go back to this ways and means issue and securitization. As we speak today, do you know the bond yield of our euro bond? And they are securitizing this for 8.5%, which is way beyond our euro bond threshold. Are we not going to lose money based on that securitization? Certainly we will. Uh, but you know, uh, the debt management office in their wisdom, they may be having access to some information that we don't have. So, uh, and as agency of as agency of government, there are other information that they may have that we don't have. I don't work with the agency, but I want to give them benefit of the doubt. Maybe there are some other econometrics or other mathematics they put together for them to be putting forward that figure. But you see, <laughs> even if you go with eight percent, it's a matter of time, because the foundation is destroyed. The foundation is revenue, and that was why I like what the DG said, that the problem, Nigeria cannot continue to borrow indefinitely. It will put that, the agency is more or less in a bad light. But what many did not know is that those that are supposed to be relieving the stress and the issues around the agency are the revenue collector from immigration to custom to FRS and so many other agencies of government that are supposed to be helping to collect revenue. Unfortunately, they are not doing enough. Then also, I don't think you can uh, bring rates down to so maybe 5% or 4% without having basis for it. I also think that the National Assembly, we need to, maybe if they are the economists, to advise them on what the government has presented. Because this is not political. If you make mistakes to pass, of course, uh, I, I tell you, all of us will pay for it. Some of them will remain in the assembly, some of them will not, but I believe their family members and those that are related uh, to them who are Nigerians will pay for it. But let me quickly say this on the issue of debt and why, why I am even concerned about what we are borrowed. Now, when you borrow, you ask for what purpose. Government have also said, we are borrowing ourselves out of recession. Now recession is gone. We are borrowing ourselves because of infrastructure. So there are three reasons when it comes to argument of borrowing that economists have presented over the year. The first argument is what is happening to debt to GDP. Debt to GDP, by the way, is the least among the three arguments. For Nigeria, debt to GDP still seems to be, uh, to be we can accommodate it. So, but the second reason is what is happening to debt service, not debt, debt service to revenue. 
Debt service, when you look at revenue, we are expecting. In fact, 2022 uh, debt service to revenue was 80%. That should be around 33%. But we have uh, uh, about 80%. For 2023, debt service is over 6 trillion. Compare that to what government says we generate in revenue. And you see, we have never been able to meet up with revenue target. But the last but the most important one is what is the percentage of total debt? I mean, the growth rate of debt, I beg your pardon, compared to the growth rate of the economy. When you compare where we were in 2015, less than 15 trillion naira debt, to 2022, end, end of the year 2022, approximately 70 to 77, depending on the figure you want to use, trilli uh, trillion naira. By what percentage have we grown? In seven or eight years, if you like. But what percentage have we grown? But when you look at the economy, the economy is struggling to grow at less than 2% on the average. Well, growth expected, according to patients in here, is 3.3%. Whether that is high enough or not, we don't know. This service to uh, revenue ratio is put at 80.6%. However, you know, as we begin to uh, wrap up, I'd like to ask you about subsidies. The Minister of Finance says subsidies will have to go by June. What is the guarantee that the incoming administration will agree to that? I will not say no. That's not our first assignment. We want to settle down first and uh, allow Nigerians to still enjoy a uh, subsidy. How realistic is that projection by the Minister of Finance? Well, I doubt if that is realistic. Um, I've had engagement with some of your colleagues on this. Uh, the administration have just kicked the count down the road for the next administration to pick up the issue of subsidy. Uh, so subsidy, we have to go. But let Nigerians know. What are we subsidizing? Are we subsidizing PMS or are we subsidizing exchange rate? A country that the currency is susceptible to devaluation. I can prove to you today that what we are paying for is not the value of PMS. What we are paying for is exchange rate. What was exchange rate of fish and parallel markets in 2016, 2017? What is it today? So if at 180 naira or 250 naira, whichever you want to use, if our exchange rate were to be what it was before, and the price of PMS is what it is today, I can tell you that there will be no need for subsidy. That is equation one. The second equation we need to understand is when it comes to the issue of subsidy, you will put your country under more pressure. As a matter of fact, under national income, economists will say income equals to consumption plus investment plus the difference uh, between, uh, plus, uh, I beg your pardon, government expenditure, but the difference between import and export. What government will do is to remove that from government expenses into directly into consumption, either co private consumption or for uh, invest uh, or for public uh, public consumption because people will now need uh, to pay for, uh, for 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 subsidy directly. Here is where we have the challenge. When you ask people to pay directly and nothing has been done to their income, nothing has been done to their living standard. Eventually, people may find themselves on the street of Abuja, Lagos, Edo, and Kano protesting because they will suddenly realize that as government has marketed the issue of subsidy, they have not done something to the issue of their welfare. I am by no means supporting not removal of subsidy. I support that subsidy should be removed, but as an applied economist, I must tell you, it's not going to be an easy task for any government, whether now or the one in future. President Wadi administration has said subsidy was removed in, two, in year 2020. I laughed because I know that the fundamental for subsidy removal has not been done. You must have your local refinery running. The four refineries should run. The private refinery coming mainstream should be active. If they are not active, we are only joking about subsidy removal. Two, we have to have some level of stability. President Wadi, when he got to office, some of you journalists spoke with him, and he was very strong on non that, that he will not devalue the, uh, the, the amount we are exchanging naira for dollar. But some economists had advised him, uh, one of them has advised him, that he should even allow free flow of naira, that those that are traveling abroad will not be able to come. And I laughed again, because the clothes we all wear, myself in Abuja and three of you in Lagos, 
All the fabrics are imported. They are not made in Nigeria. So what happens to our children that we spend 80% to import, I mean 80% of the uniform they wear, whether in public school or rural school, they are all imported. We need to understand that economic is holistic that we, than, we, than we think. So subsidy removal, I doubt if it will go completely in 2023. What government may do is to perhaps shift the goalpost by saying it's no longer going to be 180 or 187, it's not going to be maybe 250, but until those fundamentals of making refinery work on first hand and also do I find this stability around the exchange rate? I doubt if Nigeria will ever be able to remove subsidy. Well, on that note, we'd like to thank you very much, uh, Paul Alaje, for joining us today on The Morning Show. Thank you very much indeed for your passion and commitment. Thank you, Doctor. We'll thank you, a... and thank you, your colleague, for having me. Yes, uh, our name is Ayo. Ayo Myro is here. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll be talking to Kunle Adegoke, a senior advocate of Nigeria. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months, it doesn't matter if you run a salary account with First Bank or any other bank. Just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance, and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Reflection of the Nigerian never say die spirit. They never stay down. You're always thinking of how to improve. You're always thinking of how to move forward. My name is Emmanuel Ahimieho. I've been a civil engineer for 18 years. I'm the project manager of Obadana Kaba Road. The Obadana Kaba Road is 43 kilometer built completely of concrete pavement. We started work on December 2016. I remember when we came here, it was virtually lifeless. We're building a road that we know will need very minimal maintenance. It's a road that we don't need to rush back to in five years, trying to carry out major maintenance work. We don't need to import anything that we need on the road. They are all locally available materials. 
all the cement we use on this road is from Dangote Cement Factory, which is the largest cement factory in Africa. The sand is from the communities, so people from the community, they end up becoming suppliers. Imagine supplying sand for a 43 kilometer road. It's a lot of money. There are things I've learned from building this concrete road that I never knew 10 years ago. And to be able to lead those people to achieve something worthwhile, something that is of value to them, to the community, to people who have never met us. And I am positive that the road will last most of the people who are building the road. Along this route, you have up to 12 communities. People have the confidence to open shops. Why? Because you know someone is going through the road, they sell their things, they sell their goods. That is more money for them. We have a number of eateries now, and you want to buy food along the road, you get fresh food, not fruits that are preserved. No, you get fresh food. So it is good for us, and it's good for the community too. The road is a lot more safer now for everybody, including Halima, including other travelers. So they have better road, lesser crime, shorter journey times, so a lot of advantages. I've had people who go through the roads and they stop to just say, well done. We are proud of what is happening here. We're happy that this is going on in Nigeria in our time. We can see it. They are proud of it. And I think it has brought life back to the communities. I feel very proud, extremely proud being a part of this project. This Naimeka, he like to keep money for her. As CBN deadline don't they near so. This one now why is the maker? As he don't yet say deadline they near. He won't carry money good deposit for the right place. With access bank. It's time to spread your wings and fly. Reach for the sky. Even if the bank too far. Now to go to the nearest access to that agent. Don't carry last with your money. Get up, get up right now. Money where you deposit for access bank. Now money where you go make your mind rest. Well, well. Don't let the money spoil for your hand, oh. Ten million naira today. Fifty zero naira tomorrow. Boya, oh, Musa, Shade, Onye. Carry your money go access bank or access to that agent. Where near you? Access more than banking. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. A high court of the Federal Capital Territory has quashed the allegations of a fabricated false assets declaration against the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu. In an originating summons by Somadina Uzuabaka against Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, the claimant sought, among other things, an order of mandatory injunction, injunction directing and compelling the INEC chairman to recuse, excuse, and exclude himself and or step down as the chairman of INEC pending the investigation and consideration of the various allegations against him by the various law enforcement agencies. The claimant also sought an order of court barring the INEC chairman from holding or assuming any public office for a period of 10 years. Professor Yakubu, who counterclaimed against the claimant, furnished the court with several exhibits to show the sources of money for the purchase of the properties which the claimant alleged were illegally acquired and insisted that his assets declaration were validly done. However, Justice M.A. Hassan of the FCT High Court in a judgment delivered dismissed the suit challenging the legitimacy of the assets declared by Yakubu for being incompetent and lacking in merit. The judge subsequently, consequently, barred security agencies from investigating the INEC boss over his valid assets declaration. This recent suit against the INEC boss is reminiscent of the suit filed against the central bank governor, Godwin Emefie 
Kelly after the introduction of the cash limit policy. Joining us on the show this morning to discuss this suit against the INEC boss is Kunle Adegoki, a senior advocate of Nigeria. Welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Mr. Adoko, good morning. Can you hear us from the studio here? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, thank you very thank you. much. Happy New Year to you all. The same to you. Thank you. Well, yesterday when we discussed this topic, I was saying, look, evidence is 99% of the law. And what Justice uh, Mary Hassan ruled is that, look, the plaintiff, uh, Mr. Somadina Uguamaka, has no concrete evidence against the INEC uh, chairman. But some people, after the program, raise the issue that do our courts, should, or, or do they have the right? Well, maybe that's not how to phrase it. Should our courts say that certain categories of persons in public service should not be investigated? Because the other leg of it was that Justice Hassan ruled that the police, the DSS, the ESCC, and other agencies of government are barred from investigating the INEC chairman. What do you think is the gravamen of uh, uh, the ruling in this particular instance? Uh, thank you very much. We all agree that it is within the precincts of judicial powers to issue rulings and give judgments. However, the validity of the reason contained in a judgment or a ruling is another issue altogether. And where a judge gives a ruling or a judgment and same is found to have contravened probably the provisions of the law with respect to what the judge can do, it is open to challenge by not only the party involved, even by the public as to criticize such a judgment. While the judge has the power to dismiss the allegations made against the INEC chairman if they are found not to be worthy of concrete evidence on which they are supposed to be premised. At the same time, it will be outside the jurisdiction of a court. It will be ultra a judge to give an order that a particular person or categories of persons should not be investigated or prosecuted by law enforcement agencies. While the Constitution recognizes some people as enjoying immunity under the law, these people are clearly stated in the Constitution by virtue of Section 308 of the Constitution, and they are limited in number. We are talking here about the president, the vice president, the governor of a state, and deputy governor of a state. Outside these four persons, no individual, whatever your status, whatever your position, enjoys immunity from being prosecuted. And even the immunity enjoyed by the president, vice president, governor, and deputy governor is immunity from being prosecuted or from being sued in respect of any action while they are in office. It is not immunity from being prosecuted. The Supreme Court has pronounced on this in a matter filed by Chief Ganifai me against Ashura Dibola Tinobu in those days, that you cannot prevent the authorities from investigating a crime. Whereas it is within the ambit of the powers of security agencies to determine whether they are going to prosecute somebody or otherwise. Now for Justice Hassan, whatever could be the uh, premise upon which his lordship based the ruling to prevent the security agencies from investigating the INEC chairman or proceeding against him, I believe it is outside judicial powers and it would amount to an abuse, which I believe parties interested ought to challenge on appeal and get same quashed. Because where a crime is suspected to have been committed, it is the duty of every citizen to report same to the appropriate agencies. 
However, the prayer compelling the IG or compelling DSS to investigate someone may be refused by a court, by a judge. That judge cannot now say that the individual is hereby protected from being investigated or from being prosecuted. That will be outside the provisions of the Constitution and other laws empowering a judge to adjudicate in a matter in this regard. Hey, all right, Mr. Dekoke, what would you say about some speculations or perhaps postulations that these prayers before the courts might be politically motivated. Um, we've just heard of the court, the case of the INEC chairman, and just before then, as I mentioned earlier on, the case of the governor of the CBN, Gordon Emefiele, in similar um, fashion where the DSS had approached the court uh, to, it, to arrest him. Do you think these um, cases might be politically motivated in line or in view of the fact that elections are in less than 50 days? Yes, that is a very huge possibility. The cases might be politically motivated. There is no doubt about it that people are bound to read speculations into cases when they come at certain particular times in the life of a people or in the life of a nation. And considering the issue of the CBN governor, more essentially with respect to the cashless policy that is now being reinvigorated and reintroduced, and the redesign of the Naira. Everybody, including myself, I had a feeling that that particular application by the DSS might be politically motivated. I am sure that politicians, I am one of them, politicians are most likely to be against the issue of Naira redesign or reissue or the cashless policy. Elections are won today by the amount of cash that you can dispense. We've seen cases where governorship elections are won on the basis of the amount that a politician is ready to dispense to an average voter, up to 10,000 10, naira, 15,000 naira per vote. And in a society where we have vote buying, as a morbid culture of this nature, it is very, very important for the authorities to intervene to ensure that cash would not be circulating recklessly and aimlessly in all quarters as to afford certain powerful individuals to be able to buy the consciences of the less privileged and the less guided. And it is in this regard that majority of us who support the idea of doing everything necessary that will prevent Naira from being grossly abused as it has been subjected to over the years. And for our political fortune to depend on who has the hugest what political chest at a particular point in time. While the cases filed by the individuals involved might be seen as being politically motivated, I believe that the people who have uh, a very sound and reliable opinion that one can say that these cases might be politically motivated. I don't see any reason why the DSS will have to make an application to a court of law to be able to arrest the CBN governor. It is the power, it is the statutory and constitutional power of the DSS to arrest any individual who might be suspected to have committed certain offenses or certain acts that might be injurious to the security of the nation. And security of the nation in this regard might come from several angles. It might be physical, it might be financial, it might be in any way. And we are DSS actually really honestly and genuinely believes that Godwin and Mefiele have done something that is contrary to the laws of the land, empowering them to arrest him and probably even uh, launch a prosecution. They don't have to make an application to the court, get him arrested, but the application they made by which they will be able to arrest and, de and detain for a number of months or days is actually an abuse of the law. And why am I saying this? This, is, this should be ju juxtaposed with the provisions of the Constitution that guarantee fundamental rights to personal liberty in favor of every Nigerian. 
And where the authorities, where security agencies feel that an individual has committed a crime, the first thing is to do concrete and thorough investigation, do discrete investigation by which all your evidence would have been gathered, would have been solidified. When your evidence has crystallized and you now move against the individual, there will be no basis to even delay his being arraigned in court within a period of 24 or maximum of 48 hours. Where security agencies have their evidence already gathered and they now move, just like the uh, American security agencies will do, they have been following Osh Poppy for so many years. They were following a particular client of mine for about 20 years into different jurisdictions all over the world before they came to Nabim finally in Nigeria. And when they got him in Nigeria, evidence before the court showed that the man must be repatriated. Immediately, the federal court, I court, saw the evidence. It granted the application and was repatriated. And immediately he got there to the United States. He was prosecuted and he pleaded guilty. So in within a very short time, the whole case was concluded. So that is why it is important for DSS at this point to make such an application to the court to be able to detain the man for a period of 90 days, 180 days before they will bring a charge. By then, this government would have expired. By then, the cashless policy that the CBN governor was trying to launch would have, would have, would have been defeated. And politicians, the election in Nigeria would have been conducted. Politicians would have been able to do the miracle, the magic that they want to do with cash. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, great to see you, sir. And happy New Year to you, sir. So is it that we are throwing the baby away with the bathwater? I know the arguments are on ground, you know, that yes, you should not say that uh, you cannot, you know, investigate people and all of that. But the court giving a definitive stance, is it not because of the situation we are in today, which we have a legal system we don't talk about, that people can go nocturnally to go get injunctions here and there at the back and cause problems for all of us? And there are no checks and balances by the NJC in the first place. I mean, isn't it laughable that a DSS, which is supposed to see that has the best information and the best data in the country, took something to court that could not even stand the test. And afterwards, with constant attacks prior to this time, that there were exposure as regards the INEC chairman, then somebody finally still went to court. And the legal system are aware of this. So isn't this drooling supposed to be like a punitive deterrence to others that don't bring rubbish, pardon my friend, to the court? And if possible, the judges should start giving hefty sanctions on these politicians that are running amok in the country. It's because we don't have checks and balances. What do you say to that, sir? Yes, thank you very much. Um, when you look at the situation we have found ourselves, it's such that every day Tom and Ari uh, rushes to the court to file applications to obtain injunctions, to obtain orders against individuals, against institutions. And because our rules, we have rules in place that actually allow courts to award FT fines, FT costs against frivolous applications. And such applications are not, not such costs, such deterrent costs are not meant to be awarded against the litigant in particular alone, even against the lawyer that asked the court to file such an application. In, under the legal record rules, and um, generally we refer to such costs as wasted costs. And you see instances when the Supreme Court has even done that. For instance, an application was brought by a number of senior advocates some uh, years back where they made prayers uh, asking the Supreme Court to make uh, to reverse itself in respect of a particular decision. And the court did not hesitate to award every cost against even the lawyers personally. And when we look at the approach of our judges in many of these cases, where they fail, where they, uh, they, 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 they slack in respect of their responsibility of issuing costs and deterrence and punitive costs, against such individuals. They only allow such persons to get away with blue murder and to not only rubbish the judicial process, 
they waste taxpayers' money. When you look at the dockets of the court, you discover that practically all our courts are overwhelmed with so many cases. And when their lordships are even dying out gradually as a result of being overworked, somebody is bringing an application. So for the DSS, in this instance, to even bring such an application, it is within the powers of DSS to just sit back in his office, follow the individual, do the investigation, conclude it. After concluding it with all the, uh, the, the, the provisions of the law at their disposal, with all the provisions of the, I mean, the, the gadgets that they have access to, information, technology, and everything, they can nail, they can nail easily the CBN governor where he is suspected to have committed certain crimes without really having to apply to a court to obtain an order. Such okay, an order, Mr. Mr. Adegu, okay. I agree with yes, you. Sir. I agree with you. Yesterday, I argued on this program that the missing link in Justice uh, uh, Miriam Hassan's uh, ruling is that she did not award costs for, against Sumadina Uzuamaka for bringing frivolous and vexatious petition before the court of law and also the lawyers in that case. Uh, you know, maybe our cause should be more, uh, you know, attentive in that case. But you use the word, you say you are a politician and would like to have your take on some of the political developments. One, uh, President Obasanjo endorsing P2B uh, he's not alone. We have Chief E.K. Clark, we have Papa Yuadi Banjo, and all of that. And then the G5 crisis in the PDP. Briefly. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I often try to avoid uh, some of these complex political issues, but insofar as uh, the uh, issues that uh, affect Nigerians and will affect our interest as a people, I definitely must comment on them. Well, President Olusha Gnobasanjo is a Nigerian of eminent status. That is one. Two is that he is a Nigerian that enjoys all the rights of every other Nigerian. And to that extent, he has the right, he has the power to support any politician, to endorse any politician. Reasons why he's endorsing a politician is a, second, a secondary issue. Where such reasons are found to be uh, personally motivated in terms of maybe self-aggrandizement or selfish motives, well, we can criticize them and get the people to realize that this is not the appropriate line to go. This is not the appropriate person to follow. But President Obasanjo endorsing uh, Peter Obi, I believe that it is his personal right and is voicing out his personal opinion that nobody can deny him of. And I would say that just as I too personally have the right to support any candidate, endorse any candidate the same way that uh, Chief Obasanjo has the right and power to endorse uh, Peter Obi, and the same thing will go for all others as well. So I believe that at this particular point in time, all Nigerians should realize that having the right person in our political offices will be the only way that we can alleviate poverty, that we can ensure that the future of our children, generations unborn, will be made better, will be better guaranteed. And to that extent, every Nigerian should go out, obtain the PVC, the qualification, the right attitude, the right mind frame of all politicians that are contesting right now will be for the masses, for the people to judge. And they must realize that it shouldn't be a question of how much am I able to gain. Look at the pedigree of the person you are supporting. Look at his antecedents. What has he achieved before? What are his few points on the economy, on the political situation in Nigeria? How is he trying, how is he going? to ensure that the children of the poor who have access to education, that all of us who have access to health care, quality health care, how is it going to ensure that there will be jobs for our youth, millions of whom are now thronging the streets and committing crimes? How is it going to ensure that security is guaranteed? These are things that we need to critically engage our politicians on. We must ask questions. We must ask questions. Does arise just on all okay. programs. So I believe that we need to ask questions okay, and let our people realize that it is not enough. 
case somebody is endorsing somebody okay. or somebody is supporting another, for them to say, yes, this is where I'm going because my leader is doing this. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you, uh, significance of that address. Time for a short break on the morning show. When we return, we'll have Rising Zalism on the finish on us to review top series. There's news for to stay with us. Naira notes? Don't panic. Here's what you need to know. Ensure to make deposits of all old banknotes before January 31, 2023. To make the process seamless for you, all Fidelity Bank branches will be open till 6 p.m. on weekdays and 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays to allow for cash deposits only. Also, please note that bank charges on all cash deposits have been suspended by the CBN. However, charges shall still be applied on cash withdrawals. The new banknotes can be accessed at any Fidelity Bank branch nationwide from December 15, 2022. Old banknotes will remain in circulation till January 31, 2023, when they will cease to be legal tender, as directed by the CBN. For more inquiries, follow us on our social media channels or email us at true.serve at fidelitybank.ng. You can also call 0700-3035-489 or reach us on WhatsApp on 090-3000-5252. Thank you for banking with us. We are Fidelity. We keep our word. Introducing an all-time mega offer. Get over 50% discount in the Airtel Home Broadband Mega Offer. Buy a router for just 10,000 Naira and get up to 240 gigabyte or a MiFi for 5,000 Naira and get up to 125 gigabyte bonus data. More data, more you. Reliable Home Broadband Buy. Airtel, the smartphone network. The Zenith Better Life promo is back, and it's bigger and better. You could be one of 20 lucky customers to win 150,000 Naira every two weeks from now till January 31st, 2023. To qualify, simply open a Zenith Bank account and maintain a minimum balance of 5,000 Naira. For more information, visit www.zenithbank.com forward slash better life. Zenith Bank, in your best interest.
imagined your wallet can be everything. Well, almost everything your bank is to you. That's exactly what First Money Wallet is. First Money Wallet from First Bank is another swift and seamless way to bank from your mobile phone. It doesn't matter if you have a First Bank account or not, nor the mobile network you use. Everyone can open a First Money Wallet and it's very easy. Your phone number is your account number. With First Money Wallet, you can send money using just a phone number, receive money, pay bills, buy airtime and data for yourself or someone else. Else. Any check balance, you don't need a bank account at all or BVN to enjoy the boundless possibilities First Money Wallet offers. All you need is a registered phone number and you can fund your wallet easily through your first bank account or any bank account and debit card. What's more, First Money Wallet is highly secure with fingerprint technology and PIN. And when you need cash, just walk up to any First Money agent near you to withdraw money. No smartphone, no wahala. Just dial star 894 star 1 hash on any phone. So, it doesn't matter if you live in the city or the remotest part of the country. With First Money Wallet, your transactions are easy, seamless, and secure. Download the First Money Wallet app now. Input your phone number and follow the prompts. Or simply dial star 894 star 1 hash. All money now on First Money. You first. First Bank. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Arise News analyst Emmanuel Efeni. Great Malabaj. Good morning. Good morning, Ruben. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning. Yes, let's start the review with this day Nigeria's newspaper of record. The lead story, chance of Atiku, Atiku, as Makinde launches second term campaign. G5 members committed to PDP, says Autumn at Oyo rally. Aggrieved governors refused to name presidential candidate to support. Ikpiazu Kinsman pledged support for Atiku. PDP PCC mocks Tinimbu's rally for inability to speak on policy issues at Kanu. Kanu, PDP. APC candidate tired, has nothing to offer, he should go home and rest. Finally, Wiki approves Atiku's campaign rally in Rivers. Now, the G5 governors, also known as the Integrity Group, they were in Ibadan yesterday for the launch of Sheyi Makinde's campaign for his second term bid. Now, January 5, they said they were going to announce their preferred presidential candidate. They did not do that. They have a uh, conviction of their position, but they seem to lack the courage to take the next logical step. But of course, it was fun yesterday for watchers of the political scene as people were chanting, Atiku, Atiku, Atiku. But Ruben, you are saying a whole governor is doing boy boy. But I, I can see where you are coming from. Because yesterday, yes, on weekend was even calling the governor of your state, the youth leader of the G5, 
a governor that many have been commending, a young man who is doing well, who has prospects, bright stars, shining star, now is being reduced to, to quote my friend Ruben, the boy boy level. You don't call a governor youth leader, whether irrespective of his age. All governors are equal in this in the country. Well, but for the G5, the the beat goes on. But Nigerians are watching. Their inability to name their preferred candidate as promised is another promise not kept. Now the Nation newspaper also reporting the story. Presidential poll. G5 keeps PDP supporters in suspense. Makinde to announce preferred candidate. Group protests exclusion of Atiku's name on lists. Well, um, but above the lead story. Tinubu, I will convert Yahoo boys to tech experts. <laughs> ah. I thought somebody should, we've been condemning our young men who have taken to criminality, turning uh, fraud into a lifestyle. Converting them, I don't know how that is going to be done. <laughs> we have a lot of young men who are tech savvy who are not into criminality. Yes, ma'am. I think that is where we should be looking uh, towards. And those who are criminals, we name them, call them out, and punish them. You don't convert a criminal to an expert. An expert who will continue with his criminality, perhaps the messaging. Uh, you know, sometimes you have a problem with this as you messaging. That, maybe that's not what he meant to say, uh, but I get the idea. You have to punish criminals and reward those who are tech-savvy, who want to be experts in their field. I think that's the distinction. Somebody has to uh, perhaps take him to the side and give him a brief lecture on that, instead of just coming to tell the world that you, are turned, you want to turn Yahoo boys to tech experts. The last time somebody even danced Yahoo dance uh, music, coincidentally, at um, Disney Music Show. Colin Powell. Yes at uh, Royal Albert Hall in London, just dancing the music he had problem in America, for dancing the music. And here, a, a presidential candidate telling the world, you want to convert Yahoo boys to tech experts. Well, we move on. The Guardian newspaper, 2023, tame inflation, insecurity, fuel, subsidy, experts tell government. Yes, stakeholders across business communities are saying, Insecurity, financial leakages, free fall of the Naira, rising debt, and other factors could stall economic progress as the country heads into election. I think that is a no-brainer. Uh, even the man on the streets now know that we're heading into tough times. Tougher times, because we're already in tough times. But the Business Day newspaper also reporting the budget, 2023 budget, hangs on meeting oil targets ending subsidy. Well, this government is not ready to end subsidy until it leaves office. It has kicked the can down to the next administration. Will the next administration bite the bullet and do it? Even if you want to do it, you have to think twice. Because when Jonathan, after the 2011 election, with so much popularity, January 2012, when he tried it, of course, people went on into the streets, of course, many of those who were in, uh, at the Ghani Fahmi Square later found themselves in government. And uh, they've been given excuses ever since. Now, the Vanguard newspaper, all government payments must be cashless from March. NFIU says only president can grant waiver for excess cash withdrawal. Payments for whatever purpose from public treasury affected by new guidelines. Embassies. Development partners, others affected, violators to face money laundering corruption charges as federal government withdraws 225 billion naira cash. State government, 701 billion naira cash they withdraw. Local government area, areas, 
withdrew 156 billion naira cash from 2015 till date. Well, this is the new law. Well, some are also contesting that whether the NFIU has the powers to uh, run this rule over states and local government. But they're saying they are depending on the CBN Act concerning the currency, which uh, they are relying on. Now, we'll see how that pounds out. Now, the Nigerian Tribune newspaper, uh, NFIU bans cash withdrawals from government accounts from March. Now, the New Telegraph newspaper, I just go to the second lead, increase education tax to 10%, as you tell federal government. Well, industries, mm -hmm. manufacturers are already complaining of the slight increase, but ASU is asking for 10%. Well, I'm sure they are not going to get that from this government, but that is on the high side. The issue is not how much you tax, but how well you spend the education tax we're already getting. Is it getting down? There are other sources to also fund education. You don't have to kill uh, industries manufacturers and other corporate entities because we want to fund education. But we must fund education adequately for the system to run better and produce better um, graduates, as it were. Now, the date, we just go to the foreign newspapers quickly. In the UK, Prince Harry, I don't want to say it's trending, it's there all over the uh, newspapers. The Daily Telegraph, please don't marry Camilla. Yes, Harry reveals brother, brother's appeal to their father and described uh, coming to blows with uh, arch nemesis. He's describing his brother, Prince Williams, as his arch nemesis. Now, the Duke of Sussex has claimed that he and his brother uh, once begged their father, uh, King Charles, not to marry Camilla. Yes, the biography, the autobiography of um, Prince Harry coming out. Now, snippets from it not looking good. The Times of London uh, reporting Harry spills his secrets in devastating memoir. He calls William Arknemesis, claims he killed 25 Taliban, says brother attacked him, of course, the Daily Express, looking at this, what he's revealed so far, reconciled because he told uh, um, his interviewer in a recent interview that he wants to reconcile. But, but the Daily Express asking, reconcile? But you sold your soul. Well, the Daily Express quoting <laughs> experts were saying, commentators saying, the Duke of Success, Prince Harry, sold his soul in return for mega box. Ruben Rufa Ayo. I, I, is there I, any way back to reconciliation I between doubt. Harry I, I, and the royal family? I, 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 <laughs> doubt, I doubt there's a path back to redemption. And I think Harry should watch it because where he's going is, is getting too far. Is he not revealing too much? For it's instance, much. his tour of duty was a state secret. It was even after he left that it was revealed. That it was Harry revealed now before. saying that he killed 20 by 25 Taliban fans. I hope he knows that is has exposed him to a lot of security risk for saying that. That the Taliban might likely come after him. So there are a lot of state secrets now that he's revealing because his tour of duty as, as was- As well as royal secrets. And royal secrets. Yeah. So I don't know if somebody could rein Harry in. I think this is the time to talk to him because this, this man is on a path of destruction. Interesting and, and, and all of this, is it because of uh, his wife? Is it because of a, his wife that he's doing all of this? Things like this are definitely going to have a, a knock-on effect. If I'm talking about his wife... I protest it's not his wife. Because I was going to say when you said that who's going to rein him in. Harry has always been known to be the rebel out of huh. both, you know, in the royal okay, family. Okay, no, talking so, about his wife. Daily Express saying, Mega told Kate. She had baby brain. Okay. Ruben, shouldn't somebody be getting uh, uh, his, no, no. his, his the own The point sad. about all of this yes. is that the uh, United Kingdom is one of those places in the world where the royalty is still very uh, influential, yes. despite uh, uh, the vituperations of anti-monarchies like uh, Walter Baggio 
you know, you still have the royalty. But we keep getting reminded all the time that the royals are also human beings. They have their own problems. Every family has its own problems. So we live in a human community. Edward VIII left the throne because of a woman, an American woman. <laughs> Simpson. Simpson. So are you Simpson. saying these American women? No, no, no. Uh, don't, don't put, I don't want to mention that. Don't, don't put words into my mouth. Another American woman? <laughs> don't, don't put words into my mouth. <laughs> Lady, uh, you know, Princess Diana, the mother of uh, Prince Harry, also, you know, went with uh, Daddy Al the, the Al Fayed, Al -Fayed. Uh, you know, the Arabs, an Egyptian, and uh, <laughs> you know, and it became an issue. And now you have a son, Prince Harry, uh, writing a book. Who oh, spare us? The book is titled "Spare," yeah. But people are now saying, "Oh, Prince, spare us." The, these details are too uh, difficult. But the simple issue is that, look, if you look at family settings, we are all human beings at the end of the day. Whether the, the uh, Prince Harry's blood is blue, and uh, if any blood is red. No, I have blue also. <laughs> yeah, I have blue also. I don't know. I don't need but to some people have blue blood. <laughs> they have uh, red. Some people have red blood. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we are all human beings. True. And we all have our issues. No, but Robert, I'm sure that, that they will resolve. That. Shouldn't people sometimes edit their own story? Uh, Must you tell all? It's sad. It's sad. Well, it's actually, sad. I believe it's deliberate. At this point now, it's actually quite well, deliberate. How people, how people react to grief. There is a, I think it's Kubla Ross who wrote a book talking about stages of grief on death and dying, Kub Susan Kubla Ross. So people react to grief in many ways. There are persons who say Prince Harry has never recovered from the death of his mother, and hence how he's been treated, and the fact that he's a spare tire who may never make it to the throne, and uh, he's expressing himself. So maybe he needs counseling. Maybe he needs uh, whatever, but who are we to judge? And don't blame the wife, okay? He's, an, he's mature now, okay? I don't want to call him another boy boy, you know, because he's mature. He makes his own choices, okay? So, but we'll see how it plays out. But he will make a lot of money because yeah, I'm even yes. looking for the book. When the book comes out, we would like to read it because the uh, publishers, they've done a good job of promoting that book. So. Is he using his family to make money? That's yes, another that's question. That's why some, co some commentators are saying he has sold his soul to make a mega box. But the bigger issue in the UK is that the UK is beginning to look very much like a third world country. The other time when we saw people in London queuing up for fuel, we said, ah, in the, in the UK, how can people be queuing up for fuel? In fact, we recommended on this program that maybe some people are experts in carrying jerry cans and in, uh, you know, uh, sucking fuel from uh, uh, places, you know, should go to the UK and help them out. Now, you have the UK government saying that they will introduce an anti-labor okay. legislation, yes. okay. which will insist on minimum uh, service uh, uh, okay, rules. I, but I, we'll, I, I think we'll they're calling us out now. Okay, yeah. okay, we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Emmanuel Lefini. It's time now for a short break. When we return, the delectable Ojinika Ope will be here with details on what's trending. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Get your loans with no collateral. Hey. Vault is the answer. 
quick sign off. Zero paper work. Step by step to your dream business with Vault. Vault is available to individuals, SMEs, and corporate customers. Download Vault by Polaris Bank from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today. together for the first time in years was uh, a little bit awkward. Grandpa still tried to entertain us. Mom was always still in the spotlight from the kids. It wasn't until Grandma cracked a joke. That's my favorite prayer. That we got back into our groove. In this festive, DSTV is making family time even better with an upgrade. Stay connected to DSTV and we'll upgrade you to the next package for free. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now is the delectable and elegant wow. Ojinika Ope wow. with stories trending really around Dr. the world. Abati. Hello, Jinika. You've added more now, huh? <laughs> How are you this morning? I'm Great. good. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Good, good to morning. You. How are you? Good morning, very Perfect. Well, good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Oji. Great. Morning. Well, all right. Good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In Italy, Pope Francis on Thursday led the funeral of former Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, tenderly touching the coffin of his predecessor as he stood, supported on a cane, before tens of thousands of mourners, with some calling for the late pontiff, born Joseph Aluosis Ratzinger, in 1927, to be made a saint. It was the first time in more than 200 years that a pope had led the service for his predecessor, Benedict's death, at the age of 95 on New Year's Eve, brought to an end the decade of the former and present pope, leaving side by side in the Vatican. While in the United States, President Joe Biden paid his respects to the former pope, Benedict XVI, visiting the Vatican Embassy, formerly known as the Apostolic Nunciato of the Holy See, to sign the condolence register. Biden, who is Catholic, described the late pontiff as a brilliant scholar, a great theologian, and a truly holy man. Then, in Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari condoled with the Vatican, clergy, and Catholics over the death of the late Pope, describing him as a true servant of God. The president, who was represented by the Minister of Women Affairs, Dame Paul and Talent, at a requiem mass in honor of the former pontiff in Abuja on Thursday, said that he hoped Benedict XVI will be remembered as a true servant of God who lived in humility and peace. Under sports, 
Cameroon's under-17s face a race against time to field a team for the regional African Cup of Nations qualifiers after more players failed age tests ordered by the president of the country's football governing body. Samuel Eto, the former Barcelona and Inter Milan striker who helped Cameroon to two successive Africa Cup of Nations in 2020 and 2022, has insisted on using magnetic resonance imaging screening for the squad out of the initial 30-member group. 21 failed the age test. Finally, on the entertainment, the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, in his recent autobiography, Spare, claimed that his brother William, the Prince of Wales, physically attacked him during an argument over his wife, the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle. In the memoir seen by the Guardian newspaper, Harry wrote that his brother was critical of his marriage to Meghan Markle and that he described her as difficult, rude and abrasive. During the argument, Harry alleged that William grabbed him by the collar, ripped his necklace and knocked him to the floor. In a new clip previewing his recent interview with ITV, Prince Harry refused to commit to attending his father, King Charles III's coronation in May. If you're invited to the coronation, will you come? There's a lot that can happen between now and then. But, you know, the door is always open. The, the ball is in their court. There's a lot to be discussed, and I really hope that they are willing to sit down and talk about it. Do you still believe in the monarchy? Yes. Do you believe you'll play a part in its future? I don't know. Begin what's trending. The presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Paula Ahmed Tinubu, on Thursday dismissed the endorsement of Peter Obi by Nigeria's former president Olushagun Obasanjo. Tinubu, while speaking at a rally in Benin, the Edo state capital, said that Obasanjo is trying to deceive Nigerians by endorsing Peter Obi, insisting that the former president is not qualified to recommend a president for Nigerians, and described his endorsement as a blind man leading the blind. Can that man recommend a leader for you in Nigeria? No! Is that no sending an agent to pick your pocket? Eh? A blind leading the blind. I'm sorry. I'm not insulting you medically impaired people. But it don't go well. They will end up in the ditch. If I talk about Obasanjo and Obi, uh, you think they are human beings together put. One who don't know the way cannot show the way. Well, Tinubu. Also criticized Nigeria's former vice president and the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, stating that Atiku cannot boast of any good job that he has done for the country, and described him as a customs officer who cannot define the ethics of civil service provision. Tinubu went on to state that if elected into office, he would provide jobs and turn internet frosters, known as Yahoo Boys, into experts at manufacturing and creation of chips. Then in his usual fashion, delivered yet another inscrutable lingo. Let's take a look. We will create hubs. We will turn this state to energy state. Amen. Turn the so-called Yahoo, Yahoo boys to experts in manufacturing and creation of chips that we intercept and our I cannot even get the people that are applauding, but let me take some reactions, I'm sorry. Um, Chinaza wrote, Tinubu campaigned in Lagos and in some other northern parts. He didn't insult their young men, but he reached Edo State. He called the young, the young men Yahoo boys and that he will turn them into manufacturer of chips. This is to tell you that this man has no regard for the South, South, and Southeast. Well, Olayemi wrote, I will turn the so-called Yahoo boys to experts in manufacturing and creation of chips and 
and dot dot dot. <laughs> you heard that, right? <laughs> this <laughs> clearly shows that Baba Tinubu is lying with no clue. Let me tell you, 98% of the so-called Yahoo boys can't even write a hello, yes, Rufai. No, but, but, but that tweet is true. <laughs> Most of these Yahoo boys are boys that, you know, when you look at them, yeah, some of them have education, but the moral part of them is bankrupt already. A lot of them can write this, can write that. Only very few of them can write all of that. So what was even the expression about the Yahoo boy? If we talk now, they'll say we are talking. What's the expression about the Yahoo boy something in the first place? People that are doing fraud... What about saying you are going to improve on the ICT hubs, like CC hub and the likes we have, like Mr. Feni was saying? The next thing you are saying, Yahoo boy. What concern us are Yahoo boys now again that you are putting? So what are you even insinuating? Why did even the topic of Yahoo boy come? You have a lot of Nigerians doing well. You didn't even mention likes of Flutterwave, innovating, building tech unicorns. We will improve upon that. You are improving upon Yahoo boy. And it's getting too much with all this on the, What did he say? Then I'm like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Is I it mean, speaking um, in tongues or what? Or is it just he went into a spiritual something or? Well, do you know some people are saying that it might even be um, the technique he's using to remain relevant? You I mean, never that, know. That, people that, are saying. That, I mean, that, he's that, been that, trending, that's not a good so technique. But yeah. let's go back to this context of the matter. He said a lot of things there. Like I said this morning. For the sake of balancing, politicians will call anybody the devil when it's not going in their interest. He's abused the vice presidential candidate, uh, the presidential candidate of the PDP, calling him a custom officer. Did he call him the same custom officer when they were together in the APC? Because we forget that all of these politicians were together at some points. Or let me even dial back. Did he call him a custom officer, or could he call him a when they were together at the SDP in the nineties? So when you hear politicians talk, I think Nigerians should be wise now to think of what politicians can do for them. And on this campaign, I didn't hear of the ideas that will invigorate the nation. Let me talk about you. You were saying that uh, it's not issue-based campaign, it's ethnicity, it's all of that, which is a sad commentary on how we become as a nation. Yes. Because that means we are not moving forward, and that's why the problems will persist. We vote for people based on sentiments. We don't vote on the issues. Then we don't have a right to complain when the country goes down the drain. I think Kwan Kwan so made a very valid point. So it's we should go back to the issues. So issues when you well. see them abusing themselves, Nigerians, ask yourself, what can they do for you? If they can't do anything, leave them alone. But most importantly, get your PVC. That's right. the most important thing because that was so close. Um, a lot of people might be disenfranchised. All right, Dr. Bati. OK, number one. I think that uh, politicians, presidential candidates, and their spokespersons must realize that all of this race is going to end by March. By March, we will know who has won, who has lost. OK, so how do they face the people they have abused after the elections? How do they face, you know, uh, live up to the MAT that they have created? Uh, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed you know, who is calling uh, uh, Baba Basunjo a blind man. Okay, so after the election has been won and lost, will he be able to stand in front of Baba Sonjo and say, uh, you are a blind man? The same blind man that he went to visit in uh, Abeokuta. Okay, some people say he, didn't, he wasn't looking for his endorsement, but he paid him his due respect right. as an elder statesman. Right so the blind man was good enough for him to go and visit. So now the, he says, uh, 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 President Obasanjo is a disabled man, you know, a man living with physical disability. So I just think that, look, there should be civility in the language. And we have made a point here that the presidential candidates are the ones setting the bad example mm. for their associates and their spokespersons. Second thing is that people must also realize that the law frowns at hate speech, vitriol. Part of the problem we face in this electoral process is that nobody is enforcing the law. If you look at the electoral act from section 91 to 92 to 93, penalties are even prescribed. Even for broadcasters also, there are penalties for hate speech, for heating up the polity. 
but nobody is doing anything about it. So these guys go onto the campaign uh, uh, platforms. All they do is abuse people. No, that's unacceptable. People who want to lead Nigeria should show good example. Now, uh, uh, apart from calling Obasanjo a blind man and uh, P2, P2B, P2B, I hear that that is uh, the way it's called, you know, a blind man. He also said that uh, Atiku is a customs uh, officer who does not know anything, who has no knowledge of uh, uh, ethics, and who cannot even define the ethics of civil service uh, provision. We don't need all of that. What we need are the ideas about how you want to lead uh, Nigeria. But he spoke uh, about uh, tourism, turning Edo State into a tourism destination, the antiquities and all that. Okay, maybe that's one uh, major issue. And as for the language that uh, you said he spoke, okay, uh, Frank Shaibu uh, has written, uh, you know, a response to that. Frank Shaibu is one of the spokespersons of Atuku, you know, and he quoted what he said in Weri, what he said elsewhere, and all that. Well, if I was uh, Ashwa Jutinubu's uh, strategist, I probably would come and say, well, what Nigerians do not know is that the man speaks other languages that may not be known to Nigerians. <laughs> Maybe it's a polyglotal, you know, uh, affectation. Uh, so when he says blah, 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 or he says guru, 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 or, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe he's a polyglot. But then his strategies need to identify that language for us. <laughs> but going forward, he should speak the kind of language that the electorate we understand, not uh, blah, 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 guru, 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 guru. No, you know, I, I think that's the point there. But well, all right. The strategist can turn it around and say, he's a polyglot. He speaks in many tongues <laughs> as the spirit moves. That's in. exactly what I thought. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> in another development, the presidential candidate of the new Nigeria's People's Party, Rabi Ukwankwasu, has also reacted to Obasanjo's endorsement of Peter Obi, stating that it is wrong for any person who is considered a statesman to go about endorsing candidates ahead of the February 25th presidential election, adding that those leaders endorsing candidates are disgracing themselves. It on the news that uh, they are supporting or they are endorsing Mr. A or Mr. B, I think it's, it was a big mistake. These are leaders with respect. There is a time in your life that you become a real statesman, not a politician. And uh, I can tell you also that any candidate, any party that comes out of the face of ethnicity or comes with the issue of religion, that party, that candidate, I can assure you at the national level, that that person has failed the election even before it starts. And many people don't even understand that in Northern politics, nobody owns the voters. Voters don't have any forum to meet. Love and support goes around like virus. And once people take decision on a particular candidate, I can tell you nothing will change whether somebody endorses from the North or from the South or from outside the country, it doesn't matter. And I want to advise our leaders, please, if you see them, you tell them, that they should not stop disgracing themselves. We have so much respect for them. If I become that old and at that level, and I'm sure the same with everybody, I want to come and start playing party politics, and especially politics that has to do with religion. Ayo, over to you. I mean, I thought he made a good point about politics yes. that has to do with religion and Absolutely. ethnicity, as Dr. Abadi had highlighted earlier. Absolutely. I mean, thank you very much for starting that way, because I was going to say that there is merit to, he, to what he said. Mm -hmm. However, unfortunately, all the candidates are guilty of playing politics along the lines of ethnic yes. and religious sentiments. He himself just said in Northern politics, except I didn't hear him quite well, and I thought, oh, okay, you know that politics was divided according to region. You know, he could... So we, they keep pulling up that card when it is convenient for them. And 
then when it is not in their favor, they then say that, no, it should be based on credibility, on who you are and what you are. I'd like to ask, um, you know, Mr. Rabiu, Alaji Rabiu Kwakwanso, his engagement with other parts of the nation aside from the North, you know, how deeply he's engaged as much as he's done with the North. But beyond that, I also want to um, just talk about what he said, where he says that it will have no effect on the electorate who are a lot wiser now. Mm -hmm. Jumping on what Rufai said, unfortunately, and, you know, Dr. Bati said that earlier this morning, unfortunately, the electorate is still none the wiser. We're still, just recently, famous musician Brimo famously tweeted about how we should vote for this ethnic ethnicity, this candidate because of his ethnic background. And we are saying that Nigerians are wiser. If you just look at comments underneath tweets or underneath um, videos or interviews, and the only thing people are pushing for are candidates based on where they come from or religious alignment. If we're going to move forward as a nation, we cannot continue to vote candidates based on, if you ask many Nigerians, what does this person stand for? What are his, have you seen his manifesto? What is the ideology of the party? Half of Nigerian, let me not. Uh, that's, uh, let me not give a number, but a lot of people cannot articulate it, including everyone who is watching now. Think back: Why are you supporting the person that you are supporting? Is it based on what they stand for, or just because I like him because he's my brother? We come from the same place. It's the time of the east. It's the time of the north. If we continue to play politics that way, we will never move forward as a nation. Well said, Ayo. We shall take our final story. Last month, the Independent National Electoral Commission commenced the distribution of permanent voter cards at its local government offices nationwide. However, many Nigerians have complained that they are yet to receive their voter cards just weeks to the presidential election next month, as we'll see in this video that is now making the rounds on social media, showing voters in front of an INEC office in Abuja that are yet to receive their cards. This is the ANEC office, a back office in uh, Abuja. The ANEC office is supposed to close by 3 o'clock. This is uh, 127. They've closed the people outside. They're not getting their PVCs. A lot of frustration, a lot of anger. People are not getting their PVCs, you can see. They're banging on the gates. They want them to open up. They don't know what's happening. They're not giving them their PVCs. They are also sitting inside. They're taking their materials inside. They've cleared the tables, you can see. I'm not giving anybody any PVC. This is after one. I'm supposed to close by, by three o'clock. They have closed up their gates. But after one, we must go. People are here. It's our right. Very annoying. It's my time. I'm spending two thousand naira for this temporary. I'm spending two thousand naira for this. So I'm not here. The guy gives me. Why? Why? Why would they give us? Uh, this is completely unacceptable, INEC. We need to stop this madness. As you were saying, Rufai, your fear is that a lot of people will be, voters will be disenfranchised. I, I was talking last week to a political researcher as well who talked about the, the uh, uh, issue in the Southeast where yes. a lot of the voters are going to be disenfranchised. Yes. And obviously we know that the past two elections had been postponed. And it, my fear is it's going to happen again quickly. Really I mean, that's a sad reality. Oh, yeah. A lot of people will be disenfranchised. If, if the deadline is just uh, at the end of uh, January, I think 22nd or 25th, I don't yeah, know the particular. 22nd. 22nd, the particular date. I'll have to fact check myself on that. A lot of people will be disenfranchised, and we cannot afford this to happen. And I cannot come out, keep, keep telling us that we are working at it. No, 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 no. it doesn't cut fair. it. Let people get their PVCs one way or the other. This Look for a only yesterday. This is and, and there are many videos. Yes. More yes. Than okay. This. By way of information, Victor Aluko, mm. uh, the uh, director, uh, the uh, director in charge of voter education, has been saying this week that by tomorrow, INEC is going to take the uh, release of the PVCs from the local government level to the world's level. So INEC still has an opportunity to wake up and fulfill its own promises. Mm. If they do not do that, the question will be raised. What other promises has INEC given us that we need to doubt? Okay, because clearly, the same INEC has said, without PVC, you cannot vote. Mm -hmm. So not to allow people access to their votes, you know, will be uh, counterproductive. I mean, the banks told us they will be working on Saturdays to give us new notes. We can't find the new notes. No. INEC says uh, they will give us uh, uh, PVC. They, they, uh, nobody can get the PVCs. No, you cannot be using the position of government, no. you know, to tell lies to the people. A government that lies to the people 
you know, will have to double check itself. So INEC needs to wake up. So this is not just video. It's a wake-up call for INEC. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jenica. Thank you all for your great analysis, as always, Ayo. Well, that's all I have for you on What's Trending today. I'll see you all next week. And that's all on today's edition of The Morning Show. Rotus Odiri will be here next to take you through Global Business Report. Stay with us. It's the Rice News Channel. This Naimeka, he like to keep money for her. A CBN deadline don't they near so. This one now why is the maker? As he don't yet say deadline they near, he won't carry money good deposit for the right place. With access bank. It's time to spread your wings and fly. Reach for the sky. Even if the bank too far, get up, get up, now to go to the nearest access to that agent. Don't carry last with your money. Oh. <laughs> get up, get up right now. Money where you deposit for Access Bank. Now money where you go make your mind rest well, well. Don't let the money spoil for your hand, oh. Ten million naira today. Fifty zero naira tomorrow. Oya, Musa, Shade, Onye. Carry your money.